Traveling had always been my biggest passion. Growing up poor in a cramped shoebox of an apartment in Chicago, never having enough space and privacy always made me long for a better lifestyle. Most of all, I longed for the opportunity to travel to different places. I met Jace back in college, and we bonded over similar backgrounds and struggles. We did everything by the book. Applied ourselves to our studies, got married, went above and beyond at our respective jobs, and slowly climbed the corporate ladder. After eight years of that unrelenting dedication, we were both beyond burnt out, depressed, living in a beautiful place we barely had the time or energy to enjoy, and completely disconnected from each other as a couple. Something had to change, and luckily, it did. He approached me with the proposition of taking a couple of months off to travel across the country, just the two of us. Jace's hobbies were car remodeling and cooking, so he already had a plan laid out and a sprinter van that he said would be perfect for remodeling and converting into a motorhome with decent kitchen features. We had nine months worth of savings, so worst case scenario, we could travel for a few months and go back home before we ran out of money. After three months of intense planning and preparations, we quit our jobs, got on the I-90, and never looked back. I used my writing experience to create a travel blog, and not long after that, we started a YouTube channel that grew surprisingly fast. Instagram and TikTok came after that, and our numbers kept growing and growing. Within a year, we found ourselves with hundreds of thousands of miles traveled, a cross-platform community with over 4 million people, a new outlook on life, and new careers. So yeah, van life wasn't the wonderland that people portrayed online, but I wouldn't exchange it for anything else. Our lives were perfect, or so I thought. On a random Saturday afternoon, someone commented on our last YouTube video asking if we heard about a murder that had happened on the outskirts of Idaho since we'd just been there. I was about to answer that we hadn't when the thread of comments underneath it gave me pause. It read, At Nanny XO, Weren't they in Salt Lake City when that wedding singer went missing like two weeks ago? At Princess258. OMG, totally. And that teacher in Colorado? I think they were there too at the time. Does anyone know? At the Lionheart SU. Just checked the video from last month and yeah, the timelines match. At Nanny XO. That's crazy. Do you think they are involved? Someone should look into it. I was stunned. Were people really insinuating that we had something to do with those poor women's disappearances? It was beyond ridiculous, so I brushed it off. Except it kept happening. Over the following weeks, we traveled across state lines and I obsessively checked the new comments as they poured in, detailing their new findings to one another. Jace left the whole social media aspect of things to me. He didn't have any social media accounts, so he stayed completely out of the loop. It was for the best. Those commenters were way out of line, and I didn't want to upset him with those wild accusations. One month into that whole ordeal, someone left a link to a Reddit post of a viewer claiming to have done a deep dive into our content throughout that year. I told myself it was just a stupid internet conspiracy theory and that I would ignore it. Still, my curiosity got the best of me. When Jace went out on errands, I read the post. It was a lot. The user, by the name of The Inspector Gadget, linked the disappearances of at least five women to our cross-country travels. Just two of them, their bodies, had been found so far, both abandoned in large bodies of water. The more I read, the less sure of things I was. Could they be onto something? But what was the connection? How would he even meet these women? Where and when? We spent nearly 24 hours together, and on the rare occasion that we'd split, it was to do errands. Not even a criminal mastermind could commit a murder in such a short time, in broad daylight, and leave no traces behind. I spent the rest of the day dazed, on a loop, constantly thinking about the possibility, then berating myself immediately after. No, I knew my husband, and he wasn't a killer. No way. Jace was an attentive and dedicated partner. He had the habit of cooking elaborate romantic dinners for us two or three times per month, constantly gave me gifts, and always made sure that I was taken care of. Hell, now that we were trying to have kids, 
He even put together a whole regiment of vitamins and supplements for us to take, and created a meal plan to make sure I had proper nutrition. No way, not my Jace. When I clicked on the website created by the family of Marin Collins, a 25-year-old fitness instructor, a photo of her came up, front and center. As I inspected the photo, trying to commit her face to memory, my eyes landed on the earrings she had. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I recognized those earrings right away because I had them, or a pair just like that. I took them out of my small jewelry box and confirmed they were identical. Worst of all, they've been a gift from Jace, one of the many spontaneous gifts I'd gotten from him over the past few months. I started hyperventilating. Why did I have the earrings of a dead woman? Why did my husband give me the earrings of a dead woman? There had to be another, more logical explanation for that. The earrings weren't even that unique, either. A gold, delicate, dangling chain with a pearl at the bottom. They were probably sold everywhere around the country. Right, that makes sense. Hey babe, you okay? I was calling you. I was so distracted, freaking out, that I failed to notice him returning. I looked up at him, hoping I could mask my emotional state. He would never forgive me for suspecting him. No, yeah, sorry. I'm just feeling a little off today. I didn't sleep well either. You took melatonin yesterday? I nodded without taking my eyes from the screen, removing all the traces of my research. Well, don't forget to take your supplements today. I already got your vitamin D for this month too. A sudden chill went down my spine. Over the last couple of months, Jace had been extra diligent about me taking vitamins and supplements to get my body ready for the baby. But he took supplements too, and they were all easily accessed inside the cupboard. Not all of them, my mind supplied. He always handed me the vitamin D every time, and I don't remember ever seeing him taking it from the package either. No, it couldn't be. Could it? I always thought it was strange how deeply I would sleep sometimes, almost like I passed out or something. Could he be giving me the bad pills? I had to find the truth somehow. The next time he handed me the vitamin D, I refused, saying that I'd gotten enough sun that week. So it was best to just skip it until the following week. He didn't insist or anything either. I also skipped the melatonin that night, just in case. But I still slept deeper than I normally would have. That week, we had another one of our romantic dinners, and things felt like they did before. I convinced myself I was letting those people's crazy ideas get to me, but two weeks later, things changed. Something told me to check the Reddit thread again, and sure enough, there is another update. They found the body of an exotic dancer who had gone missing three months ago in Carson City. We were there at the time, as the viewer noted in the post. What they didn't know was that three months ago in Carson City, Jace gifted me a very flashy lingerie set that looked more like a costume than anything else. Not at all something I would have bought for myself either. And when I asked about the lack of tags, he simply said he knew it was my size, so there would be no reason to exchange them. He would ask me to wear them sometimes too. I felt sick to my stomach. Could it be? The next time Jace handed me vitamin D, I pretended to take it but actually hid it under the mattress. The hours passed by as I laid there in the dark, being as quiet as I could. I barely suppressed a whimper when I heard Jace's voice calling my name. Sometime after, he called my name again, but I knew better than to make a single peep. He got up from the bed and started moving around the van. I didn't know what he was doing since I couldn't open my eyes, but he wasn't being that quiet either. My heart sank when the engine roared to life and we slowly drove away from the place where we parked. That time, it was impossible to not think of the worst of the situation. What could a man possibly need to do in the middle of the night while his wife was passed out cold in the bed? I prayed he was just a regular scumbag cheater and not something worse. Sometime later, the van suddenly stopped. I heard some noises that I vaguely recognized as him putting on his heavy hiking boots, and then the unmistakable click of the door being locked behind him as Jace disappeared into the night. It didn't matter though, I had my own set of keys. After mentally counting until 100, I opened my eyes and verified that I was indeed alone. 
I put on a black hoodie to help blend in with the surroundings and went out of the van. I tried to think about what I'd read in the Reddit thread and some articles online, and remembered the bodies that were found in the water. Using the GPS on my phone, I found my location and saw there was a river nearby. I walked parallel to the riverbank, searching for any sign of him, and it didn't take long until I found it. Jace was on the edge of the river, stuffing pieces of torn fabric inside a plastic bag, and that was when I noticed he had black gloves on. I swallowed dry. Near him, there was a gray-looking body, so discolored and pale that I could almost gaslight myself into thinking it was a mannequin. Almost. It was hard to see properly, but the body looked weird. The proportions looked off somehow. Horrified, I noticed that big chunks of flesh were missing from the body. Pieces of her large thighs had been removed, leaving an open window into her decayed insides. So was her chest. Gone. Why would he... No. I felt sick to my stomach, bile rising up and up in my throat. Jace always said that the thighs and the breast were the best cuts of meat. His favorite, he said. He just failed to say what type of meat it was, and he made me eat it as well. Sobbing silently, I covered my mouth with both hands while my eyes were still glued to Jace. It all felt like a horrible nightmare that I couldn't wake up from. My husband, the man that I've loved and was about to start a family with, was a serial killer. A cannibal and a serial killer. It was too much to handle, and at that time, I couldn't suppress a deep sob. And in the quiet of the night, Jace heard me. He looked up, his eyes searching for any sign of movement as he prepared to attack. I knew then that the man I thought I knew didn't exist. He would kill me, just like the others. I had to get away from there and fast. I wasn't strong like Jace, but I was smaller and faster. So as I turned around and ran, I prayed it would be enough. My desperate breaths were almost as loud as Jace's heavy footsteps behind me. I overestimated my speed because with every step I took, his sounded closer and closer. But I could already see the road ahead, and if I got out of the darkness of the woods, there was a chance I would make it. Except, Jace's heavy body tackled me to the ground, and we both rolled over the damp earth. You bitch! He spat in a tone I'd never heard from him before. With his big hand around my neck, he squeezed over and over again. I tried pushing him away, but he was simply too strong. My own husband was about to kill me. A distant headlight briefly passed by, lighting bits and pieces of us both. Suddenly, everything stopped. Anne? And that was the moment I realized that, because it was pitch black, he hadn't noticed that it was me he was chasing until that very moment. His hold around my neck loosened, and I could muster a few words. Jace, what are you doing? Annie, I'm sorry, I didn't know it was you. He begged, checking my body for injuries, even though it was too dark to see, even though he was the one that hurt me. You can't tell anyone, babe. I made a mistake. You can't tell. When wet droplets started falling on my face, I realized he was crying. As he babbled nonsense on and on, I searched around me for anything I could use to defend myself. My right hand landed on a heavy rock with slightly pointed edges. It was now or never. I aimed at where his voice was coming from and swung the rock as hard as I could. He grunted and slumped to the side. Anne, I wasn't going to hurt you. Yeah, right. Tell that to the other women you killed, you sick dog. He was down, but not out. I had to hit him again, or I was done for. Like godsend, another car passed by on the road, and I used the few seconds of light to aim at his head again. I had no idea where my phone ended up but his was still safely kept inside a pocket of his cargo pants. I dialed 911 and waited on the line with the dispatcher until they arrived. Safe to say, I will be a vegetarian from now on.
My sister Lily took me to the Burning Man last year. I usually didn't join Lily on her wild adventures, but I had just gotten dumped by my boyfriend and I needed a distraction. On our first day there, as we were exploring the area and looking at all the weird art installations, a really handsome bearded guy named Clay introduced himself. He noticed Lily and I were checking out an art exhibit made out of old motorcycles. He asked us what we thought about it. Honestly, I thought it was really ugly, but I didn't say anything. I'm glad I didn't because Clay said that he created the piece himself. He seemed really proud of it too. For the rest of the festival, we ended up spending a lot of time with Clay. He and Lily seemed to really hit it off. I liked him well enough, but it was obvious that my sister was the one he really felt a connection with. He had this artistic spirit, just like Lily. He'd come to music festivals throughout the year and really dive into the experience, and then he'd go back to work as an IT guy. Lily worked in retail, but her lifestyle was pretty similar to his. At the end of the three days there, I was more than ready to go back home. I really needed a shower. Plus, I needed to sleep in a real bed. I told Lily that I was glad that I went, but I never wanted to go again. She understood, especially since I didn't meet a guy like she did. So we packed up all our stuff into our little rented RV and got ready to head out. Clay came over and invited us to come visit him sometime. Lily said yes, though I really hoped that she was just being polite. A guy like Clay is fun to be around at some random music festival, but he's not the kind of person I want to hang out with in the real world. I would have forgotten about him completely, but about a month later, Lily started getting these really nasty messages from a bunch of anonymous accounts. Someone had found her on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok, pretty much all of social media, and they were saying the nastiest things. She kept reporting the harassing accounts, but as soon as she got those blocked, somebody else popped up. It sounded like it was all coming from the same person. Lily really started to freak out. She didn't want to get the police involved yet, but she knew the messages were becoming more threatening, so it was only a matter of time before things escalated, and that's when she decided to call Clay. At the festival, Clay had explained that part of his job was finding information that no one else could. That included tracking down stalkers and harassers. He had a pretty high success rate, at least according to what he told us. Lily and I were home at the time. She had gotten a particularly nasty message on our email and she finally called Clay. I knew that she hadn't talked to him since the festival, but I don't know if maybe they texted each other since then. After all, they did really hit it off. Lily kept everything on our speakerphone so that I could hear. She and Clay talked about the online harassment and the best way to stop it. She read aloud some of the messages she received, and Clay sounded genuinely disgusted. He let her finish. Then he said that he'd finally identify the harasser within the week. He spent a lot of time building online contacts and staying active on the deep web where his messages couldn't be traced. Honestly, he made himself sound like a hacker or something. He didn't ask for payment or anything. Lily was just so grateful that she promised to come visit him as soon as this craziness was over. After the call, I was nervous that Clay wasn't going to come through. He seemed like the kind of guy who overpromised and underdelivered, but Lily seemed 100% confident in him. For the next two days, Lily didn't get a single harassing message. She thought that Clay had done his job, but I warned her not to get her hopes up. She called him for an update, but he didn't answer. I left Lily alone for a couple hours to run some errands, and when I came back, I saw Clay's truck parked in the front of our yard. He'd come to see Lily. I parked on the street since the driveway was blocked, and I started to head inside. When I got to the porch, I froze. Clay and Lily were talking in the living room, and I could hear their voices through the window. They were talking about me. I'm so sorry, he said, but it looks like your sister was the one who was posting about you. I can't believe it, Lily said. Why would she do that? Because she's jealous of you. She doesn't want us to be together. Clay was going to say something else, but then he turned and looked right at me. I'd been caught. I slowly walked inside, ready to defend myself against Clay's obvious lies. I was closer to Lily than anyone else. There was no way that she'd believe his story. When I stepped inside, both Clay and Lily looked at me like I was some terrible criminal. Lily even stepped behind Clay so that he could protect her against me. You don't believe him, do you? I asked her. 
Lily looked down at a piece of paper in her hands. I guess Clay had printed out some fake evidence against me. She thought for a long moment and then asked me, Why are you doing this? I'm not, I shouted. I stepped forward, ready to grab the bogus evidence in her hands, but Clay stood in front of me, puffing up his chest. I think you should leave. This is my house, too. Clay and I started loudly arguing with each other. Lily just watched the whole thing horrified. I looked at Lily, my eyes pleading her to believe me. I told her that he was lying. He was probably the one harassing her all this time. It was some big twisted plan to stay in her life. For a second I thought she believed me, but then she stepped forward and pushed me. Get out, before I call the police. I was heartbroken. I couldn't believe my own sister would trust some computer stranger that she met at Burning Man over her own blood. I knew Clay was manipulating her, but if I stayed any longer, I'd just make the situation worse. I turned around and left. I knew that I could stay with my friends for a while, but I wanted to help Lily first. So I drove straight to the police station and explained the situation to the police. The man did a quick Google search of Clay. He didn't even need to use the deep web to find out that Clay had a criminal record for harassment and stalking. He printed out the file and I took a photo of it on my phone to show Lily. She never responded to my message. That afternoon I came back home. The whole place was empty. Clay and Lily were gone and most of her stuff was taken too. It's been months now. I'm still working with the police to track down Lily, but I'm slowly losing hope. She made a horrible choice when she decided to trust him, and I'm terrified of what happened to her. Apparently, you could buy and sell anything on the dark web. Or at least that was what an article I read at work claimed. Some things were what most people would imagine one could trade online. Substance, lots of it. Arms, stolen products, counterfeit items, fake documents, things like that. Others were much more unsavory. There was a whole paragraph dedicated to a police operation years ago that dismounted an organ trafficking gang operating online. Yikes. Scary things aside, there was a brief mention near the end of the article that immediately caught my attention. It read, and I'm quoting here, And amongst all the trafficking, gun trading, and counterfeiting, it seemed that the newest craze of the dark web was virginity auctions. In select specialized websites, young women could publish their profiles with their starting price and wait until the interested parties would bid on them. Their virginities, that is. The selling prices ranged from a few thousands to dozens and hundreds of thousands of dollars, with a few reported sales going over the mark of millions. Damn, that's a shit ton of money, I thought. With my $11 an hour retail job, that was more money than I would ever see in many, many years. Maybe my entire life, even. Well, mind you, I was no virgin, but for hundreds of thousands of dollars, I could be a purple giraffe if I had to. Not that I would ever do anything with that information. That was just the kind of thought someone entertained when their minds were idle. Or when they were desperate. Either way, I wasn't that desperate. Not yet, at least. So I just closed the tab and put the crazy thought behind. Except I didn't. As the weeks went by, and then turned into months, I still found myself thinking about all that money I... someone could make. And so fast. So one day, after checking my very unfortunate bank balance, I got wasted on cheap vodka and decided, fuck it, why not? Well, I came to find out that you couldn't just search dark web and magically connect to it. But YouTube came to my aid, and I watched a lengthy tutorial from a guy who seemed to know what he was saying. And by watching, I mean I skimmed through it so I could have a basic understanding of how to connect to it and find the sites. After installing the specific browser and searching through the site the guy recommended, I finally found the infamous virginity auction market. Name-wise, you couldn't get more confusing than 040GSA dollar sign 311GSFG 151617 POINGS54S dot onion 
but location aside, it looked like a very professional website with many live auctions happening simultaneously. Still inebriated, I took some risque photos, being careful to hide my face of course, and made an ad. To my surprise, not even ten minutes after my ad was up, someone sent me a private message through the site. It had a feature where bidders could send things called tokens to some of the girls that could later be exchanged for money. I had the shock of a lifetime once I realized that the tokens he had sent amounted to almost four grand. He was giving me all the money for, what, talking to him? Suddenly it all felt too real. Could I go through with it? I wanted the money, that much I knew. But I was neither an actual virgin, or, it seemed, willing to pretend to be one. In the end, I couldn't. I removed the ad that same day and used the token money for bills and necessities. Hopefully he was wealthy enough that four grand wasn't worth fighting over, fingers crossed. I could almost pretend that my life was back to its boring normal, if not for weird little things happening here and there. First, I noticed that events I saved on both my personal and work calendar would get either mixed up or completely erased for no apparent reason. And that went on for a few weeks until I stopped using the calendars altogether. Then, I noticed people I talked to on a daily basis, co-workers and friends mostly, would mention things to me like they were ongoing topics of conversation between us, except I had no idea what they were talking about. The first few times that happened, I chalked it up to me being forgetful, or them being mistaken. But one day, I got to work to a very serious message from my boss saying that he wanted to talk to me about the so-called rumors I'd been spreading amongst the staff. Turns out, weeks ago, most of my co-workers received a text from a new number claiming to be me, asking them to save that contact, my new number. Shortly after, I started spreading rumors that our boss was granting privileges and extra hours to female employees in exchange for sexual favors. Even though it wasn't me, it wasn't even my number either, he fired me on the spot, not caring about anything I had to say. I knew then that something was seriously wrong. It hadn't been me talking to any of my co-workers. One week later, as I was getting ready for another job interview, I passed by my bedroom door towards the kitchen when something gave me pause. Something was just... off. I stood in the doorway looking at the room, trying to figure out if something was different, but nothing seemed out of place. And then I noticed. My webcam light was on. Except I hadn't used my webcam in at least a month. I was even more alarmed when I walked towards it and the light immediately went out. With trembling fingers, I searched for the folder where the webcam videos were stored, and almost had a heart attack when I saw dozens of videos there. Videos I never recorded. Most of them were recorded when I wasn't in the bedroom. I could hear myself somewhere in the apartment. But a few of them were concerning. Videos of me in my birthday suit walking around the bedroom, and dozens, too many to count, of me sleeping. Seeing the preview of them was alarming enough, but I didn't have time to check them one by one because they all started disappearing from the folder, as if I was deleting them. Except again, I wasn't doing anything. Someone else was using my accounts, controlling my computer. The rest of the day went by in a blur of confusion, anger, and fear. And I had to take a few melatonin pills to even attempt any semblance of relaxation. Outside, there was heavy rain and thunder, so it was difficult, but I managed to fall asleep. However, many hours later, I woke up to a light blinking in my peripheral vision. Now, at first I thought it might have been lightning, but when my brain supplied to me that the light was red, I knew immediately what it was. The webcam was on again. This time, even though I was walking towards the computer, the light remained on. My eyes followed the cable until it disappeared behind the monitor. A chill ran down my spine either from the windy rain outside or plain old fear, and all color drained from my face once I realized that couldn't be possible. 
I unplugged the webcam before going to bed. The only way it would be plugged in again was if someone... I halted. There was no need to look back. The wooden floor cracking behind me confirmed my suspicion. There was someone with me inside the room. The ten seconds I stayed there, frozen, shock, freezing cold, trying to catalog anything I could use as a weapon inside the apartment might as well have been ten hours. It had to be the man from the auction website, the one that had given me money. And now he wanted... what? To get it back? To get revenge? My only chance would either be reaching the kitchen or fleeing the apartment altogether. Without thinking, I bolted towards the door, but the bitter was quicker, grabbing me by the hair and halting my momentum. My scalp was on fire where he grabbed me, keeping me in place. Let me go! I screamed, thrashing from side to side, trying to get rid of him. Instead, he pushed me towards the wall, pinning me against it. I could only mumble, I'm sorry about the money, okay? I, I can't give it back now. What money? His voice was eerily calm, unfazed even, like he couldn't care less about the money. The money? Are... Wait, who are you? If it wasn't the bidder from the auction, then who the hell was he? I felt more than heard his chuckle behind me. Someone who couldn't pass on an opportunity to hack a dumb woman who accessed the dark web with zero protection, not even a VPN, and then even logged into her personal PayPal account while at it. Right. I did that to get the money from the tokens. Damn! You... hacked me? Why? Why not? It's fun. Plus, I found out all sorts of interesting things about you, Miss Camille, including that you've been hooking up with two co-workers behind their backs. Was this guy serious? He really hacked me, impersonated me, recorded me, then broke into my apartment just because I was going out with two people? So? Lots of people date more than one person at a time. We aren't even exclusive or anything like that for F's sake, I pleaded. Doesn't mean I deserve to die because of it either. <laughs> maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. My point is... I'm fed up with women like you, stomping all over people's hearts. He tightened his grip on my neck, to the point I could barely breathe by the end of his rant. I didn't know what that guy's problem was, but it was clear that it wasn't necessarily about me, or what I had allegedly done to two guys he never even met. I had to do something, otherwise I wouldn't last much longer. When he pulled me closer to him, his forearm was within reach of my face, a big tiger tattoo covering most of it. Distantly, I remembered an interview with a doctor saying that the strength needed to bite someone's flesh off was the same one that we used for biting into a raw carrot. Right. So I bit him with all I had, surprised to find out it was actually true. I went down with the force of his shove. I spat the bloody, distorted face of the tiger near his feet. If nothing else, happy to at least have caused some damage. He retaliated by kicking me in the stomach, hard. One, two, then three times. When I looked back up at him, I noticed he had a knife now. His eyes were screaming bloody murder, clear, unfiltered rage directed only at me. Crouching. He grabbed me by the hair again, this time bringing his knife inches away from my face. He used the blade to point at his arm, sans tattoo, then placed it flat against my cheek. You messed my face up. It's only fair I get to mess up yours. The metal was cold against my skin. He placed the blade in the corner of my mouth, intent on giving me a permanent smile. Bit by bit, I could feel my skin slowly giving into the blade. Any second now, he was going to slash the left side of my face. No, please. A nearby siren pulled his focus away from me as his body went upright, looking out the big window beside us. It was the only opportunity I would have, so I took it, in a move I could only describe as completely deranged. I grabbed both of his legs and pulled them towards me with all my might. It was fast and unexpected enough to tumble him backwards, his head aligned with the doorframe. 
The moron was confused because of the fall, but his hands had an iron grip on one of my legs, so I couldn't go far. I had to be fast and do something before he was fully aware again. Except it was too dark to see where his knife had ended up, and all the other knives were in the kitchen. Suddenly, my mind felt very clear. His head was in the doorway. I couldn't go past him, but I could stretch my body enough to reach the door, and his head was in the doorway. My body moved practically on its own as I grabbed the door handle with both hands, firmly, and pulled the door closed one, two, three, four times. On the fifth try, I heard a weird crack, followed by a moist squelch, and I could almost close the door after that. I walked backwards slowly until the back of my legs found my bed, and I sat on it, finally relaxing. What a night. Maybe it was time to invest in a good VPN, just in case. I loved my boyfriend Tony, but he was an absolutely terrible gift giver. For my birthday last year, he got me a weight loss cookbook and an exercise DVD, even though we didn't even have a DVD player. I asked him if he was trying to tell me something with the presents, but he just said that he thought I'd like them. Then for Christmas, he got me a new toaster oven, even though we already had one that worked just fine. It was expensive too. With Valentine's coming up pretty soon, Tony told me that he got me something really special. I tried to get him to tell me what it was because I suspected that he'd gotten me something else that I wouldn't use, but he said that it was going to be a big surprise. When Valentine's finally rolled around, Tony took me to a really nice French restaurant to celebrate. Honestly, the dinner would have been a fine present by itself, but once we were done, he gave me a big smile and asked if I was finally ready for the surprise. I said sure. He took me back to the car and handed me a blindfold. He wouldn't start driving until I put it on. I covered my eyes and then he started the engine. I could feel the car shake as we sped down the road. We drove for a long time and Tony kept telling me that we were almost there. Finally, he parked the car. I asked if I could take off the blindfold yet and he said, almost. He got out of the car and then opened my door. He pulled me out of the car, then grabbed my shoulders and started guiding me somewhere. I tried to think of what kind of surprise he had planned. Judging by the distance, we were probably outside of the city center. Maybe he had taken me to a vineyard for wine tasting, or maybe it was some sort of Airbnb thing. We kept walking until Tony finally stopped. Can I look now? I asked again. Go for it, he said. I could tell from his voice that he was smirking. I pulled off the blindfold. It took me a second to adjust to the light. It was already nighttime, so it was pretty dark. Slowly, I realized that he had taken me into a wooded area. There were no buildings nearby, just a bunch of trees. I started to ask where we were, but then Tony shoved me really hard from behind. I stumbled forward and then started to fall. He had led me to the edge of a cliff. For a long, horrible moment, I fell through the air. Tree branches whacked me all the way down. Then I landed on the hard ground. Pain shot through me and I knew that my leg was broken. A couple of ribs too. I looked up to see Tony staring down at me from the top of the cliff. He was smiling triumphantly. He cupped his hands over his mouth and then shouted down. Sorry babe, but I think we should see other people. Then he left. I couldn't believe it. His big surprise was to push me off a cliff in the middle of nowhere and then abandon me. For a second, I thought it was some big joke, but I was so badly hurt and I could hear his car drive off, leaving me there. The pain was unbearable. I could barely move. There was no way I could climb my way out of there. I was trapped and alone and really, really angry. After 20 agonizing minutes, I was able to tie my shirt around my broken leg. It didn't help the pain, but it stopped most of the bleeding. Then, using a stick as a cane, I started limping through the forest. I'm not sure how long I was out there, but eventually I made it to a creek. I started following it, hoping that it would lead to some houses or road. 
It took two hours and I was so close to death. But eventually, the creek led me to an old trailer in the middle of the woods. The trailer was surrounded by a barbed wire fence with multiple no trespassing signs. Normally, this wouldn't be a place that I'd ever want to visit, but I was desperate. I limped towards the front door. Before I could knock, the door swung open and I was greeted by an old man in a dirty white shirt. He had a rifle and he pointed it right at me. What do you want? He growled. I started to answer him, but before I could, I passed out. When I finally came to, I found myself lying on a sofa inside the trailer. The man had brought me inside and tended to my broken ankle. He was trying to pour water into my mouth. Now that I was conscious, he asked me what had happened. I told the man everything. He just listened, his face completely blank. When I was finished, he asked me where I lived. I gave him my address, assuming that he'd take me back home. Then I told him that my boyfriend was still there. I'd rather go to the hospital. He just smiled and said, wait right there. Then he left. I didn't understand what he was doing. Was he just leaving me there? I dug into my pockets for a phone, but it had fallen out somewhere in the forest. Then I pushed myself off the couch and tried to find a phone somewhere in the trailer. I couldn't find anything. I had just limped back to the couch when the front door swung back open and the man re-entered. He had a big smile on his face and he was hiding something behind his back. So, your boyfriend tried to kill you, he said. I nodded. He's tall and blonde, right? With the big nose? Again, I nodded. Grace, the man said. Then he pulled out the object that he'd kept behind his back and threw it at me. I caught the object on instinct. It took me a couple of seconds to realize that he'd just thrown me Tony's head. It had taken him half an hour to drive back to my house, kill Tony, and then return with his head. Horrified, I tossed the head onto the carpet. The man just smiled at me, waiting for me to thank him. I felt like throwing up. All I wanted was someone to take me to the hospital. I never asked him to commit murder for me. But I can't deny that I was happy too. Tony got what he deserved. Thank you, I told him. Now can you please take me to the hospital? He did. The doctors were able to stitch up my injuries and gave me a cast. I'm still recovering, but at least I don't have to worry about Tony anymore. It turns out that he was the one who got a big surprise this Valentine's. I hated working for this e-commerce company because I got yelled at every day for not being able to meet management's ridiculous expectations. They fired me because I didn't finish my assigned route, but let me tell you why I didn't finish it. To say I had a good reason is an understatement. What did they want me to do? Leave that girl? The day started like any other. Before the sun began climbing up the horizon, I was up making coffee. I filled up my 34-ounce coffee tumbler and was on my way. I was never a morning person, but one thing I loved about that job was watching the sunrise. This particular morning, the sun cast a deep pink color across the clouds with yellow streaks. When I arrived at the warehouse, I was informed I would be covering someone else's route, along with my usual one. I needed the money, so I welcomed the overtime. The route I picked up would take me deep into the swamp. The rural routes were the worst because time moved so slowly with such long distances between stops. I took the news with a smile, collected all the packages for both routes, and was on my way. My usual route took me seven hours. It was mostly in the suburbs, so it was easy and predictable. Lots of dogs barked at me. Some places had front doors I had to hunt for. At one of the stops, a cat came out and greeted me. Once all those packages were delivered, I pivoted to the other route. The first stop was a 45-minute drive from where I was. I sighed and said, so it begins. Rural routes have about the same number of packages as urban ones, but fewer stops. It takes just as long to do the rural routes because you drive for so long between houses. It was business as usual, until I rolled up to this hut of a home. It looked like it would fall into the swamp and sink if someone sneezed too close to it. 
It sat on the water's edge and was hidden among the green trees. This stop had a lot of packages, way more than all the others. I needed to unload 12 boxes, the most I have ever had to drop at one location. I started unloading the boxes and putting them by the front door. On my second trip, the front door creaked open as I stood up from placing the boxes. I recoiled back to see a scraggly old man. He had a few tufts of hair on his head and wore a grease-stained wife beater with very short shorts. His thighs were so white the sunlight reflected off them, hurting my eyes. Honestly, he may have been wearing briefs. Are you delivering, guy? He barked at me. His voice sounded rusted from a life of smoking cigarettes. Yes, sir, I answered. You have a few more packages and then I'll be on my way. He didn't say anything in response, but whipped out a switchblade to start ripping open the boxes. I continued unloading my van. I had two more trips I needed to make for him. As I put the last few down, the old man snapped, You're not going anywhere until I confirm everything is here! I couldn't give good enough a reason for not staying, so I just nodded. As he ripped boxes open, I peered into his home. There wasn't much to it, except one door locked from the outside with a padlock. It hid behind a round dinner table. The old man started grumbling to himself. <laughs> they think they can steal from me? I'll show them. Who stole from you? I asked. He must have forgotten I was there because my question startled him. You did, he whispered with spite. This catapulted him into a rant about a package that was supposedly delivered, but he never received it. I suggested that it might have been delivered to the wrong address or stolen. Either way, I told him, you can file a claim and they should refund you or send you a replacement. No problem. That happened to me before and they were quick to make it right. He stared into my eyes, not saying anything, just scowling at me. He pointed his switchblade at me. You're not going anywhere until I make sure everything is here, he growled. I lifted my hands in defense. <laughs> you got it, man. Whatever makes you comfortable. From under the locked door, I saw a shadow move. I looked at the man, and he was focused on taking stock of his purchases. Anyone live here with you? A wife, maybe? I asked. He turned away from the packages and got up in my face. That's none of your goddamn business! Okay, sorry, just trying to make small talk, I responded. Something about the locked door didn't sit right with me. Obviously, locking any door from the outside is suspicious. Like, what did he keep in there? I'm just going to make sure I didn't forget anything in the truck for you, I said, so I could sneak away for a second to investigate. I walked to the back of my truck and peered around it to wait until he became absorbed by his packages again. Before moving to the side of the house, I assessed the route. I needed to be quick and quiet, or else the old man would notice. Once I had a plan, I was off. I snaked my way to the side of the house and looked through the windows. The old man must have been a hoarder because there were piles of junk everywhere. Flies danced in the air in every room. I couldn't see much of the kitchen, but I could see the peak of a mountain of dishes. After a few more steps, I could see into the locked room. The windows had newspapers taped over them, but I found one small hole that allowed me to peek in. I couldn't believe my eyes. There was a pregnant young woman who couldn't have been more than 21 years old. Her blonde hair was so long. It must have been years since her last haircut. In her room, I could make out a tattered mattress on the floor and a large stack of books that looked like each must have been read five times. The girl spotted my eye in the hole. She gasped and held her stomach. She put a finger over her mouth to signal me to be quiet. It's not like I was going to holler at the old man, but who knows the last time she saw someone. She mouthed, help. Carefully, I made it back to my van. I looked at the old man. He now had his phone out. He must have been cross-checking the app. I took out my phone to call the authorities, but had no service. I returned to the old man and tried to figure out what to do. That girl had been locked up for years by the looks of it. I wondered if anyone had ever called the police on the man before. Was he the kind that could change his demeanor and fool the police to get them to go away? 
I felt he may have been, because to keep someone hostage for so long, you have to have some evasion skills. I wondered if I had anything that could break the lock in my van. But then I had my idea. Excuse me, sir, is there any chance I could use your bathroom? I don't get to stop very often, so might as well now that I have a chance. He looked me up and down. He turned to look in his house and turned back to assess me again. Sure, follow me, he said. I thanked him, and he led me inside. Piles of junk were divided by skinny walkways so he could move through his home. I followed him to the bathroom, and he motioned to it. I had to squeeze by him to get into the bathroom without knocking over his clutter. The bathroom was disgusting. The old man probably never cleaned it. The toilet was such a dark brown it looked black. I planned to find something in his home to smash the lock, but he didn't leave the bathroom door. I saw his shadow below the door waiting to escort me out. I looked around the bathroom. The heaviest thing I could find was the lid of the back of the toilet. I peed to keep up appearances. I grabbed the toilet lid and opened the door slowly. Did you wash your hands? He asked, disgusted. Before I could process that he, of all people, commented on my hygiene, I lifted the porcelain lid and smashed it on his head. It cracked in half. The old man collapsed, knocking over a bunch of newspapers. I jumped over him and headed to the locked room. As I hurried over, I tried to find bolt cutters or something to break the door open. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw an axe. Quickly, I grabbed it and climbed over all the old man's junk to break the door down. Get away from the door! I yelled at the girl. At the first swing of the axe, I heard her gasp behind the door. I kept swinging until a big enough hole was created to kick down the rest. The girl was crying. I extended my hand and helped her through the hole. The man began to grumble and get up. Hey! He yelled. What the hell do you think you're doing? Do you have any idea who you're stealing from? The girl paid him no regard and bolted to the door. We couldn't move that fast because of how pregnant she was, but we made it to the van before the old man could get on his feet. I helped her into the passenger seat and buckled her in. I backed my van out and sped away. We went to the nearest police station to file a report. The girl explained how she wasn't sure how long she had been there. She had been there so long she couldn't remember her real family. The girl explained how this was her second pregnancy. Her first one had miscarried, and it made the man so mad he refused to feed her for a week. The police returned to the old man to take him into custody, but they found him dead. He had taken his gun and shot himself in the head. By the time I made it back to the warehouse, my supervisor was furious. I explained the situation to him, thinking he would understand, but he said I should have alerted him so that they could have dispatched someone to pick up the rest of the packages. That's why they fired me. Ridiculous, right? They said it was my third strike or something for not finishing my route. But I thought they'd cut me a break since I saved a kidnapping victim. I still haven't found a job, but the girl... Rebecca was reunited with her family. So who cares if I lost my job? I helped reunite a family. My brother Graham moved to New York City a few years back. I'd always wanted to visit him, but I never had enough money. It took me a while, but I finally saved up enough to afford a one-week trip. I'd be able to stay in Graham's apartment so I wouldn't have to spend anything on hotels. When I told him about it, he seemed really excited. My brother and I had always been very close, even though I hadn't seen him in person since he moved. On my first day there, he took a day off from work and showed me around to all the touristy places. We went to Central Park for a bit and then ate at this cute diner he was always raving about. In the evening, Graham took me to Times Square for dinner. We walked around for a bit just as the sun was setting. It seemed like a very cool, very busy place. Graham guided me past some of the bigger shops towards a restaurant he was excited to take me to. He and his ex-girlfriend had been there a few times, but just for special occasions. He wouldn't tell me what it was, but he assured me that I'd love it. We ended up in this really fancy looking French restaurant pretty close to the subway station. It looked like it was way out of my budget, 
but Graham said that he'd pay. He told me to order whatever I wanted. There weren't any prices on the menu, so I just went by what looked good. Graham and I both ordered and had a really nice time together. We ate and talked, and it felt like we were as close as ever. The food was delicious, of course, even though it was probably the most expensive meal of my life. When we were both finished, Graham went to the bathroom at the back of the restaurant and said he'd be right back. He never returned. I waited at the table for a long time. After a while, the waiter came back asking if I was ready to pay. I tried to explain that my brother was paying, but he'd been in the bathroom for a long time. I asked the waiter if he could wait while they went to check on him. I could tell that the waiter didn't trust me. I assumed that expensive restaurants like this one had to deal with lots of people trying to dine and ditch. He literally followed me through the restaurant while I went to find Graham. I got to the bathrooms and looked inside, but Graham wasn't there. The waiter stood right behind me with his arms across his chest. He did not look pleased. I think he assumed that I was trying to trick him. I pulled out my phone to call Graham's number, but he didn't answer. I was about to try again when Graham sent me a text message. Sorry, I had to go. I'll pay next time. Happy emoji face. I couldn't believe it. My own brother had set me up. He knew that I didn't have enough money for a place like this, and he just abandoned me here so I'd have to pay the bill. I was furious. By then, the waiter called over his manager. Both men towered over me, just staring me down until I pulled out my wallet and handed them my credit card. I won't tell you how much the meal cost, but most of the money I'd saved up for this trip was now gone. I hurried out the restaurant and got back to the subway to go straight to Graham's apartment. He was probably waiting for me there. He was probably laughing over the cruel prank. Even if he paid me back for the meal, I was still so angry and embarrassed. I texted him again while I was on the subway, but he didn't answer. Then I got to his apartment. Thankfully, I had a spare key, so I was able to let myself in. He wasn't there. I decided not to call him again. He'd come home eventually, and when he did, I'd really lay into him. When we were growing up, Graham and I never fought. He was never mean to me like he was tonight. New York must have really changed him. I sat on the sofa and tried to watch TV, but I was too angry to concentrate. After a while, I finally got another text from Graham. He asked if I was mad at him. I didn't answer. Then he texted again, asking where I was. I replied that I was back at his apartment, but I was planning to rebook my flight and leave in the morning. He didn't respond for a couple minutes. Then he wrote, I don't believe you. I'm in my apartment right now and you're not here. That was a really strange thing for him to say. Was he trying to trick me again? To prove where I was, I sent him my location. Then I put my phone on the table. He sent me another message, but I didn't read it. A half hour later, I heard Graham trying to open the door. I stood up to confront him. But when the door opened, it wasn't Graham on the other side. It was a woman I never met before. She had a gun at her side and demanded that I leave right away. Normally, I'd comply, but I'd never been in such a dangerous situation before, and I was still so angry about everything that had happened that night. I was done being pushed around. I stood up straight and told her no, I wasn't leaving. She raised the gun, pointing it right at my face. I don't want to shoot you, she said. Good, I told her, so get out. She cocked the gun and started walking toward me. I backed away until my back was against the wall. I instantly regretted standing up to this woman, whoever she was. Okay, I said, I'll leave. Too late she said, laughing. The window was right behind me. I reached back and pushed it open. I figured that I could climb out onto the fire escape if things got violent. But when I glanced over my shoulder, I saw that there was no fire escape, just empty air and a long drop to the ground 10 stories below. Now trapped, I raised both my hands and told the woman that I was leaving. I tried to inch past her, but she kept pointing the gun at my face. 
don't you move, she said. You are just as bad as that stupid man. As soon as she said that, I realized who she was. This was Graham's ex-girlfriend, Amber. I never met her before, but I'd seen photos. I didn't know the specifics of their breakup, but I knew it wasn't pretty. And now here she was with a gun. Please, I said. Graham's not here. He left me in Times Square. I know, she said. I was there. She explained that she'd seen Graham take me to her favorite restaurant, the place where they'd gone on their first day together. She felt so betrayed that he'd bring another woman there that she confronted him in the bathroom. Things got violent and he escaped through the bathroom window. Now it all made sense. Graham didn't want to leave me at the restaurant. He was forced to flee. He obviously didn't send those text messages. Amber must have gotten his phone during their fight. Thanks to you, she continued. I now know where he lives. And once he comes back, he'll be mine. I just have to get you out of the picture. She thought I was his new girlfriend. I tried to reason with her to explain that I was his visiting sister, but she didn't believe it. She stepped even closer, holding the gun inches away from my face. I didn't want to die like this. I had to act fast. I said the one thing that would set her off. He never loved you. Then, I ducked out of the way as she fired the gun. The bullet flew straight out the window. With my head down, I rushed forward, knocking Amber off her feet. I was trying to push her onto the ground, but I didn't expect her to fumble forward and fall through the window. One second, she was there. The next, she was gone. I looked out the window and saw her lying dead on the ground far below. I called the police right away. Before they arrived, the door opened and Graham rushed back inside. He hugged me and apologized. He tried to tell me what happened to him, but I already knew. I told him to look out the window so he could see what was left of his psycho ex-girlfriend. When the police arrived, I had to tell them the whole wild story. I worried that they wouldn't believe me, but I guess Graham had already filed for a restraining order against Amber, which did a lot to corroborate our story. The cops left, and Graham finally apologized for the worst night of our lives. Without his phone, he had no way of calling me to warn about his ex. He was just glad that I was able to defend myself. After that, Graham and I had a wonderful vacation together. Despite everything that happened that first night, I'm glad I went. I'm not the worst looking guy, so everyone has always tried to set me up. My friends, family, and coworkers all knew a girl that was perfect for me. They knew I hated dating apps because I somehow always attracted the clingiest girls. I swear, stage five clingers had a sixth sense for me. I let my sister set me up one time with one of her friends, but she talked about her two cats the entire time. I may have been perfect for her, but she was not perfect for me. I didn't let anyone set me up again until my mom suggested Jessica, the daughter of one of her church friends. Jessica and I had known each other since middle school. She was always one of the weird, kind of ugly girls, but she grew up to be a smoke show. When my mom suggested it, I didn't hesitate to say yes. I wanted the date to go well. So I planned something special. From what I knew, Jessica was a school teacher. She really enjoyed reading and drawing. Overall, she sounded like a normal, well-adjusted lady. I planned for us to have a picnic on a lake, and if it went well, we could take a rowboat out in the water, like they did in the notebook. Jessica looked stunning when we met at the park. She wore a baby blue dress that hugged her curves and let her auburn hair fall around her face in loose curls. She was impressed by the picnic. Jessica told me that a guy had never put so much thought into a date with her. I told her all the other guys were fools for not going all out for her. The date was going well, until she started going on about something called a twin flame. Apparently, she was part of a digital school 
dedicated to helping people find their twin flames, and her pastor confirmed that I was her twin flame. So what are they, like soulmates? I asked uneasily. Kind of. Jessica was eager to talk about it. Twin flames are much more passionate than soulmates. They're meant to push each other to grow into the people we're supposed to be. Okay, I started. Uh, how do you know it's me? Because the past confirmed it. He and his wife had special insight and can identify twin flames. I brought you up in one of our sessions, and without hesitation, he said it was you. It's exciting. Not everyone meets their twin flame in their lifetime, so we've been given a gift. The whole thing was a major turnoff for me. Jessica was hot, sure, but she was too crazy for me. She talked about moving in with each other on our first date, and I had to tell her that she was moving a little fast for me. And by the end, I just wanted to get away from her. After the date, I texted her, telling her I thought it would be best for us to remain friends because I wasn't interested in pursuing anything romantic with her. Jessica freaked out. She sent me about 20 texts about how I was spiritually blocked. And if I enrolled in this class, which was $2,000, I would see the truth. Jessica went crazy. I had to block her on everything, but that didn't stop her. She created new accounts to message me. She started following me. Soon enough, I saw her everywhere. Bars, restaurants, grocery stores. I had to find new places to go, but she always sniffed me out. I ended up getting a restraining order and had to call the police one time to detain her. I told my mom to talk to her friend to get a handle on her daughter. The school Jessica talked about turned out to be some type of digital cult, so Jessica cut ties with her family entirely. None of them have heard from her to this day. The real trouble started when I began dating my now wife, Betty. Betty and I met at a bar and hit it off. She was an accountant and wanted to take things slow. Jessica learned about Betty and started harassing her online. She told Betty that our relationship would never be as passionate as Jessica's and mine's. But Betty thought I was cheating on her and had to assure that Jessica was just a nut job in a cult. Jessica started stalking Betty. She started dressing and talking like her. She started going to the same gym as her and copied Betty's routine. Jessica even tried to befriend Betty, but Betty knew who she was and told her to leave her alone. Betty and I got more serious to the point that I proposed to her. I was nervous about how Jessica would respond because her pastor encouraged her to go to the extreme lengths to convince me we had some type of divine union. Honestly, I was scared that she would show up to the wedding or something. But what she did do was so much worse. Betty told me it went down like this. Betty was in the locker room of her gym just after working out when Jessica approached her. Nice ring, Jessica began. Betty felt uneasy but responded, uh, th Thank you. She turned back to getting her things out of her locker. You guys will never work out. Surely you can realize that, Jessica said. Betty didn't even respond and shrugged at her. He's my twin flame. If you really care about him, you'll leave him alone so he and I can live in divine union. It's what's best for him. Betty did not want to engage, but Jessica would not leave. She kept going on and on about the whole divine union thing and our pastor confirmed it. Betty told her, Look, I'm sorry, but he told me that he didn't feel much chemistry with you. I know you think this is some spiritual connection, but we are in love. 
and I would appreciate it if you left us alone. I will never leave him alone. He is my twin flame. Betty lost it at this point. No, he's not. You're in a cult that brainwashed you into stalking us. Leave me alone. Jessica then pulled out a switchblade and sliced Betty's arm. Jesus Christ! Betty looked down at her bleeding arm. Jessica pushed her against the locker and taunted her with the knife. Would he still love you if you were scarred for life? Betty tried to fight Jessica off, but Jessica was bigger than her. Jessica took the knife and cut a deep line on Betty's cheek from her hairline to her nose. By then, a worker came in to do regular maintenance and saw what was happening. The worker pushed Jessica down, asking Betty if she was okay helping her. Betty was in shock and could not stop crying. After calling 911, they took Jessica away in handcuffs. I ran and met Betty at the hospital. Half of her face was bandaged. Are, are you okay? I asked Betty. She wasn't, pointing out that she was going to charge Jessica with assault, which could lead to her going to prison. Betty said that she would finally leave us alone if she was behind bars. We immediately got to work figuring out how to press charges. Jessica was sentenced to two years in prison, charged with assault with a deadly weapon, and three years of probation. Not as long as we hoped, but for a couple years, all Jessica would do was send me letters, and she sent many. She's still in jail, and I'm hoping that once she's out, the stipulation of her bothering us again is bad enough that she just stays away. Sometime last year, I started dating this guy named Steve. He seemed perfect. He was handsome and caring, and he had a lot of money. I felt really comfortable with him. The only problem was that I wasn't being completely honest with him about my past. I met him right after I had moved to the city to escape my crazy ex-boyfriend Miguel. I went through hell in my last relationship and really had trouble talking about it with anyone. On my first date with Steve, obviously I didn't tell him anything about Miguel. But then we kept on seeing each other and I started to have real feelings for him. I didn't know how to bring up Miguel. Like, it was never the right time to talk about something so heavy. After about a month of dating, I was feeling pretty guilty about not being open with Steve. He deserved to know everything about me, even the difficult parts. So when we went out to a restaurant for dinner, I decided to pull off the band-aid and tell him. I didn't say every detail, but I told him the main points. That I had an ex who was off his meds and violent, that I basically fled my hometown, and that I still have anxiety issues because of it. Steve, being the amazing boyfriend that he was, listened to everything I said as if he was taking mental notes. He asked me a bunch of questions, really specific stuff like Miguel's last name and our old address. It felt a little weird at the time, but Steve worked in IT. He was always a very technical, meticulous person, so maybe he just wanted as many details as possible. The next morning, I was still asleep in bed while Steve was off in the kitchen fixing breakfast. I could hear him humming to himself, but that didn't really wake me up. I woke up because my phone started buzzing. I heard my sister's voice on the line. She asked me if I'd been on Facebook lately. I told her no, and she said that everyone was posting memorial photos of Miguel. He had died the night before. I know it sounds terrible, but I was thrilled to hear the news. I won't tell you what it was like living with Miguel, but he was an absolute monster. He deserved what he got. Then I started to feel pretty guilty for thinking that. I asked my sister what happened and she said that she didn't know. Nobody knew except his parents and they weren't talking to anybody. I decided not to think about it and just go about my day. Steve and I had breakfast together. Nothing eventful, just a normal couple's breakfast, though Steve seemed to be in an extra chipper mood. I wanted to tell him about the news I just heard, but I thought that would ruin our breakfast. I went to work after that and tried to be as productive as possible, even though my mind kept drifting back to Miguel. I checked the news a bunch, 
but there were still no specifics about what had happened to him. That afternoon, Steve surprised me at my work with a bouquet of flowers. He'd never done that before. I asked him what the occasion was, and he said that he wanted to make sure I had a good day. He convinced me to leave work early, and we went to take a walk around the park together. The flowers were beautiful. He was in such a good mood. It was a very romantic afternoon, until we were all alone in the middle of the park and a really weird smile spread across his face. He looked like he was proud of himself. Then he asked me, So, how's Miguel? That's when I knew that Steve had something to do with Miguel's death. It wasn't just a coincidence that my ex died the same night that I told my current boyfriend about what a monster he was. Horrified, I backed away from Steve. What did you do? I asked. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> I was just online and I happened to mention your ex to a couple people. One thing led to another, and I might have signed you up for a little kill swap. What the hell is a kill swap? He looked around to make sure no one was nearby. Then he explained that he didn't just work in IT. He used the deep web to work with clients that were very particular about their anonymity. And somewhere in the deep web, on some website that no one can find, there's a place where you register a person you want killed. Then you partner off with another client, agreeing to kill each other's target. It's a perfect plan, he said. There's no way to get caught because you never find out who the other person is. Everything is completely anonymous. So... You've sent someone you've never met to kill Miguel? Yep, he said. But I think he's from Santa Cruz, because that's where you're going to kill his target. I couldn't believe it. This guy was crazy. There was no way I was going to murder somebody. How could he possibly sign me up for something like this without talking to me first? I ran away. I couldn't be near him anymore. Wait, he shouted at me. Let's talk about this. You can't tell any. I didn't hear the last part of his sentence because I was too far gone. I ran all the way back to my car and hopped in. The bouquet Steve had given me was on the car seat. As I drove away, I threw the bouquet out the window. I didn't want to be near them. But when I looked down in my lap, I saw the car that had fallen out of the bouquet. A street address was written on one side, an address in Santa Cruz. I knew what I had to do. I drove straight to the police station and showed them the address. I explained everything that Steve had told me, even though I barely understood any of the deep web stuff he was talking about. But when I said the words kill swap, the officer flinched. He was looking at the card at the time, but he threw it back at me. I don't want to see this. Take it away. Too late, I told him. You saw it. Now whoever lives at that address is in danger. Can you help this person before he's killed like Miguel? The officer took a long, sad breath. Whoever lives here is already dead. I've dealt with kill swappers before. The people in those deep web groups always have backup killers waiting. But that's not the worst part. I was afraid to ask. If someone ever goes to the authorities with any information like you just did, then everyone they love will be killed. I really wish you hadn't shown me this paper. For your own safety, I'm not going to write a report. I grabbed the paper from him and went back to my house. All of Steve's stuff was already packed up and gone. As soon as he realized I'd gone to the cops, he fled. It's been a week since I talked to the officer, and so far, two of my cousins and one uncle have already been killed. I know that more deaths are coming. I don't know how those people knew I went to the police, but they did, and now I live in constant fear. All because my boyfriend wanted to use the deep web to help me overcome my past. I lived with my younger sister Lucy. We got along pretty well and split all our expenses 50-50. Lucy and I shared a Netflix account, but we usually didn't use it unless we were together. We both loved watching the same stuff, mostly rom-coms. One day, Lucy started asking me about some horror film called The Watcher Returns. I was surprised because neither of us liked horror movies. I told her that I didn't know what she was talking about, but then she looked at me really confused. 
She turned on the TV and pointed toward our continue watching cue. The first movie on the list was The Watcher Returns. Its poster showed a man in a black hood standing in the middle of the forest with a knife at his side. It was definitely not the kind of movie Lucy or I would ever want to see. I didn't watch that, I told her. Me neither, she said. I was a little scared at that point, but Lucy didn't seem bothered. I couldn't think of any other explanation besides someone sneaking into our house and watching our TV when we were gone. Lucy said it was probably just someone stealing our password. I don't know if I believed that though. And even if it were true, I didn't want some horror movie watching stranger knowing our passwords. Lucy suggested that we click on it and see for ourselves. Maybe one of us had turned it on and just forgotten about it. The screen said that the movie was already half finished. I told her no. There was no way that either of us would have watched a horror movie and then forgot about it. Besides, there was something about that movie that really freaked me out. The hooded man on the poster looked almost too real. I grabbed the remote out of her hands and turned off the TV. The next day I couldn't stop thinking about that movie. I kept remembering the poster image of that hooded man. When I got home from work that afternoon, I turned on the TV just long enough to change our password and then I turned it right off again. I ended up going to sleep pretty early, but in the middle of the night, a scream from my living room woke me up. Thinking it was my sister, I jumped out of bed and ran through the hall. When I got to the living room, the TV was on. I could tell right away that The Watcher Returns was playing. There was a hooded man on the screen strangling a woman to death. The quality of the video was really grainy, like I was watching some home movie from the 90s. No one else was in the room. The TV had turned on by itself. I raced across the room and grabbed the remote. By the time I turned off the TV, Lucy had finally woken up. She walked into the room and asked me why I was still awake. I told her that the movie was playing. I didn't need to say the title because she knew exactly what movie I was talking about. We both stood there in silence for a long moment. Once again, I was a lot more scared than my sister. She tried to reassure me that there had to be some explanation for the TV randomly turning on like that. Maybe it was some kind of glitch. Things escalated into an argument. To calm me down, Lucy took out her phone and tried to search for other people reporting this kind of glitch. She couldn't find anything. I took the phone out of her hand and looked up the movie itself. I couldn't find The Watcher Returns on IMDb, which should have a listing for every movie ever made. I went to the Netflix website and again nothing was there. It was like the movie didn't exist. Then I went to Reddit, where I found a single thread labeled, what is this movie? It was posted by a user who said that his girlfriend disappeared after watching a movie about a man with a hood. No one else on Reddit believed him. All of the comments were of people complaining that it was just some made up story to get attention. No one else had ever seen The Watcher Returns except for this one guy and me. After reading that, I told Lucy that I was going to cancel our Netflix subscription completely. She was about to argue with me when the TV turned back on and the movie started playing again. Neither of us were near the remote. I went to turn it off, but Lucy yelled at me to stop. She said that she actually wanted to watch the movie. She was smiling, like this was some weird joke, like we were inside some stupid creepypasta story. I tried to reason with her, but she wouldn't listen. Eventually, I gave up and left the room as Lucy sat on the couch and started watching the movie from the beginning. I stayed in my room for a while, but I could still hear the screams from the television through my door. Eventually, I had had enough. I needed Lucy to turn off the movie. When I went back into the living room, the image on the TV showed the same hooded figure drowning a woman in a bathtub. It was terrible. I couldn't believe that Lucy was still watching this. But when I looked at the couch, I saw that Lucy wasn't there. I looked all around the house, but I couldn't find her anywhere. All the doors were still locked and the windows were closed. She hadn't left, but she wasn't there. I called 911 and reported her missing right away. They told me to wait while they searched. I gave them all the information I had, but I didn't mention the film. I knew they wouldn't believe me. The next day, I got rid of my television and canceled all my subscriptions. A week later, the police called me. 
They found Lucy's body floating in a river about an hour away. She was dead. I still don't know how she got there. I guess I'll never know. But trust me, if you ever see a movie called The Watcher Returns, turn it off right away. Last year, I started college in a small town in Massachusetts where my mom had grown up. My Aunt Lucy still lives in the town, and I asked her if I could stay at her house for the first semester. Unsurprisingly, she said no. She'd always been a really cold person. My mom always said that Lucy was jealous of her, but I didn't really believe that. I always thought that she was just me. When the semester started, I ended up taking out an extra loan and paying for the cheapest dorm on campus. It was awful. My roommate Taryn was a real party girl. She would wake me up at all hours of the night and I could barely sleep. After three weeks of putting up with Taryn, I had finally had enough. I needed somewhere where I could sleep throughout the night. So I showed up at Aunt Lucy's house and asked if I could stay there until the morning. She could tell that I was desperate, so she reluctantly agreed. It was nice to be in the old family home. This was where my mom grew up and I'd never been there before. My mom had died in a car accident about a year before, so I felt like I was somehow reconnecting with her. Aunt Lucy gave me a tour of the place and set me up in the upstairs guest room. She told me that I could go anywhere in the house, but I had to stay out of the attic. She said it was dangerous up there. I agreed. It didn't seem like a big deal. But in the middle of the night, I woke up to sounds coming through the ceiling. Footsteps. Someone was walking around in the attic. Before my mom had died, she used to sleepwalk. I thought that maybe Aunt Lucy was doing the same thing, which would have been pretty bad if the attic was as dangerous as she had said. So I got out of bed and walked to the pull-down door on the hallway ceiling. I yanked on the rope and a little trap door opened up. A wooden ladder unfolded to the floor. I climbed up the ladder and stuck my head into the attic. It was very dark up there. I looked around, but I couldn't see anything. I couldn't hear anything either. Then. I heard chains rattling and footsteps rushing toward me. A woman ran out of the darkness, her hair covering her face. I was so startled, I fell backwards off the ladder and onto the floor. The fall knocked the wind out of me. When I looked up, a woman was peering down at me. I could see that her wrists were chained up so she couldn't climb down the ladder. Who are you? I asked. The woman pulled the hair out of her face and I gasped. It was my own mother. How could she be here now? She was dead. Someone grabbed my shoulder and pulled me to my feet. It was Aunt Lucy. I told you not to look in the attic, she screamed. My mother's alive? I asked. She's chained up in here? Aunt Lucy shook her head sadly. That's not your mother, she mumbled. It sure looked like her. The woman babbled unintelligibly, closing and opening her mouth like a fish. She was trying to talk to me, but I could see that her tongue was gone. I could tell by her desperate expression that she wasn't a threat. She was begging for my help. I pushed Aunt Lucy and started back up the ladder. I raised my arm toward the woman, ready to untie her wrist and find out what had happened to her. I was halfway up the ladder when Lucy grabbed me by the waist and pulled me back down. That's not your mother, she said again. Then who is it? It's your mother's identical twin, our other sister. Our family has kept her hidden all her life, ever since she killed our father. My mom always told me Grandpa died of cancer, but I guess not. That's her twin? I asked. Yes, said my aunt. And did mom know about this? Of course she did, Lucy said. Your mother has always been racked with guilt over what happened. That's why she drove off the road. She couldn't handle the guilt. I couldn't imagine doing this to my own family member. It was unhuman. I demanded that Aunt Lucy let this woman go. I can't, Lucy said. She's a murderer. She'll be taken to jail. It's better than being locked up in an attic, I said. She's filthy and starving. Aunt Lucy tried to hold me back, but I grabbed her by the shoulders. I held her down and demanded that she give me the keys to that woman's shackles. Without any other choice, Aunt Lucy pulled off her necklace, revealing that she was wearing the keys on her neck. 
I ripped off the keys and then scrambled up the ladder. Mom's twin babbled something, but I couldn't understand her. I grabbed her wrist and started to unlock the chains. From the hallway below me, Lucy screamed for me to stop. I refused. I untied my poor aunt, and she wrapped me in a big hug. Even though she was much sicker and thinner than my own mother, it still felt like I was hugging my mom. It felt nice. She's going to kill you too, Lucy screamed. The woman tried to tell me something else, but I still couldn't understand the noises that were coming out of her mouth. So she gave up and shoved her palm into my face. It took me a while to realize what this woman was doing. She was showing me a scar just below her thumb, the same scar that my mother had. That's when I realized that Aunt Lucy had been lying to me. This wasn't my mother's twin. This was my mother. Aunt Lucy had faked my mom's death and kept her here all this time. She chained her to the wall and cut out her tongue. But why? I looked down to see Aunt Lucy slowly raise the ladder. You should have listened to me, she said. Then she closed the door, trapping both me and my mother in the dark attic. I was now alone with my mom. There was no escape and no way to call for help. The attic had a tiny window overlooking the yard, but the house was too secluded for anyone to be close enough to see us. In the dim light, Mom used charades to explain what happened. It was just as I thought. Lucy caused the car accident. She took my mom back here and has kept her trapped here for over a year. My aunt was an absolute psycho. I felt so sad and hopeless. When my aunt cut out my tongue too, would she kill us both? Then a miracle happened. I heard a car pull up into the driveway. I looked through the tiny window and saw Taryn walk toward the house. She came to find me. I couldn't believe it. I pounded on the window so she could see me. At first, she didn't. Then just before she reached the front door, she looked up and saw me. I used my fingers to spell out 911. She nodded in understanding and then got back into her car to call the police. I'm so glad she didn't try to go inside because who knows what my aunt would have done to her. Almost instantly, the cops arrived. I saw them through the window. Two officers walked up to Taryn and asked her something. I couldn't hear what she said, but I saw her point toward the window, right at me. I waved at them for help and then they ran inside the house. They arrested Aunt Lucy, of course. She's in a mental hospital now, and my mother is in a real hospital, recovering from the malnutrition and wounds that she'd suffered this last year. I still can't understand why my own aunt would be so cruel to her sister. I just hope that my mom can live as full of life as possible. I'm even learning sign language to help her adjust when she gets out of the hospital. Taryn and I are now best friends. We both live in my family house and carpool to campus. I don't know where I'd be without her. All I know is that as long as we're in this house, no one is going in the attic again. When you've worked at the counter at a 7-Eleven for months, very few things and people have the capacity to utterly shock you out of your skin. There are those who steal stuff and feign ignorance when they're caught. They're the least of the worries. At some point, if it was not for the fact that stealing is a crime, it becomes mild entertainment. It is human nature, I suppose. There are those who come in so drunk that they overpay. Those are another form of entertainment. You owe it to them to replace whatever they overpay back to their possession. Occasionally, some customers will come into the store armed with a knife or a gun. You also learn how to gauge these vicious types of people, not by their weapons, but by their threats. These types are manageable, but you still have to keep a gun within reach should you need to defend yourself. But a little de-escalation and everybody would be fine. The last types are the ones nobody wants, the crazies. I could smell a crazy person from afar, and it usually is in the components. A crazy person could be neatly dressed, packing all the annoyance in a well-tucked shirt, brushing against the wind and daring some minor inconvenience to trigger them to a display. Sometimes they were not so neatly dressed. They looked haggard and unkempt, but both types of crazy were equally as potent as the present danger. You just knew how to manage them, negotiate around their mindlessness, 
and allow them to walk away. I should have allowed that particular crazy person to walk away if the entire episode had not been so enervating. He was not just a red flag. He was a carnival of red flags. He was dressed in a hood that smelled rank. His beard was overgrown, stubs that should have been shaved or left to grow out of their own accord, as if they weren't so carelessly chopped. His shoes were greasy, even though I had seen him step out of his car. He looked disconcerted from the moment he stepped into the store, staring at me once before strolling down an aisle and wounding up around another. I braced myself for a strange evening, even though I said a small prayer for a smoother experience. The rustling of packs caught my attention as I leaned over the counter to see what he was doing. But just then, our eyes met. He gazed at me like an inconvenience, waved a pack of chips at me, and dipped. Come on, man, not today. I muttered in wait for him. He did not take long around the counter, and when he came around, he already had in his hand one bag of chips. I did not particularly have trouble with customers who did that, but I would rather they didn't do it until they've paid for what they took. I swallowed my observation and offered an awkward smile. He smiled back, but in such a shallow way that I didn't feel terrible about not smiling sincerely. His green eyes, sunken into his pale face, fluttered every time he chewed, and I paused to reconcile everything that he had in his hand before he dropped them. I was still thinking when he dropped all of his possessions onto the countertop. He heaved and dipped his hands into his pants pocket. Good evening, sir. I mentioned in a robotic note that was required of me. It was a 7-Eleven, not a three Michelin star restaurant. Thanks, man. He nodded at me with his hand still in his pocket. I ran the items through the scanning machine, eyes peeled for anything as his aura was so menacing I could barely stay calm. The price came up to a total and my machine beeped. I turned my eyes entirely to him and waited for his moves. He did nothing, so I asked. Cash your card. He paused, squinted in a manner that had me thinking. I had perhaps surprised him with my audacity to ask a question. I blanched, apprehensive as to what his stare could mean. I repeated the question, and he stopped staring at me with those stony green eyes. Instead, he eyed his loot for a brief moment and decided he was going to have it. You know what? He kissed his teeth and made a loud, mucky noise with his mouth. I ain't paying you a goddamn thing, boy, and I'm gonna take it. I knew what was coming, and I didn't like it. It smelled too much like danger. It made my stomach churn and my eyes reel. The 7-Eleven was empty but just the two of us. Not even the drive-in had any human presence. I put my hand up to show him that I meant no harm. It instead infuriated him. It's what you capitalist fucks do to the economy of this great nation. He spat and stepped back, flinging his hands out of his pocket. You take every single dollar from the pocket of the hard-working Americans for these overpriced plastic pieces of garbage you sell. What he was saying was not as important as what he was holding. A silver collapsible knife with serrated edges. The danger to my life was never so urgent. Hey man, easy. I whimpered from behind the counter when he began to make a menacing saunter towards me. My heartbeat quickened in my chest and I was utterly terrified that this stranger who had no idea who I was would stab me and leave me bleeding out because he had a grudge against a 7-Eleven. Do you know how many of your types I've killed? He mocked me with a laughter. Two, they died begging and whimpering just like you. America deserves better. I was right, he was a maniac. The sound of my blood pressuring through my veins drummed in my ears. The horror of this maniac closing in on me took all of my attention and the store was suddenly blurry. He would not stop. I knew it. It was in his eyes. I could tell that he was a man who felt powerful for what he did, 
because he had a cause behind it. He would kill me. His first swing at me from up the counter, kicking my machine away, made that even clearer. You and everyone like you deserve to die, he bellowed, jumping down from the counter with his knife darting at me. The space between me and him was no more than two arms length. He covered it in a flash. I reacted instinctively, reaching under the counter to fetch my weapon. I turned my shoulder and his knife, initially aimed for my shoulder, sunk into my arm instead. The pain was like fire coursing through my body. In the scrimmage, I collapsed backwards and he fell onto me. My gun went off, blasting a hole through his gut. I cried in horror as if it was the first time I ever had to use a gun on a person, and I was sure that he was dead. With adrenaline pumping through my veins, I was able to push the maniac off of me and rush to the phone on the counter. I dialed 911 and it rung twice before the call connected. Hello, it's an emergency, I said into the phone, glad I had saved my life from a crazy serial killer. About a month ago, I met this guy on Hinge who seemed like the perfect match. His name was Nick. His photo was gorgeous, and he was interested in the same kinds of movies and books that I liked. And the best part was that he lived pretty close to my office. We chatted for a few days, and I really got to know him. He was a veterinarian, and he'd just moved to the city a few months before. We were both interested in more than just a hookup, so we decided to first meet for dinner at the Italian restaurant near my work. I got there first and anxiously waited to meet him. When Nick walked in, all my excitement disappeared. I could tell it was him, but he looked about 10 years older and 100 pounds heavier than his photos. He smiled at me and then waddled over. He sat across from me and said I was even more beautiful in person. I didn't know how to respond, so I just nodded. We talked for a bit. He seemed nice enough, but I already knew that I wasn't going to see him again. I have nothing against older men or overweight men, but I didn't like that he'd lied about it. People on dating apps should always use current photos. Nick ordered two entrees and scarfed them both down like he hadn't eaten in weeks. I just ordered a salad, but I knew the faster I ate it, the faster I could get this date over with. After Nick paid, he asked me if I wanted to go back to his place. I said, not tonight. I thought that was diplomatic. He looked at me disappointed, but he told me that he understood. Then he mentioned a different restaurant that we could check out on our next date. That was the moment I should have said I wasn't interested, but I felt so awkward. Eventually, I just said, maybe. Then I kissed him on the cheek and ran out of there. I was hoping Nick would take the hint and leave me alone, but he called me about an hour later saying how much fun he had and how beautiful I was. I didn't respond. He texted me again the next day, and I still didn't respond. This went on for the rest of the week, and he just wouldn't take the hint. That Saturday, I was planning to stay at home and catch up on some chores when there was a loud knock on my door. It was Nick! He had an expensive bouquet of flowers in his hands and a big smile on his face. Surprise! He said. And it definitely was. I didn't know how he'd found my address. He asked if he could come inside and I finally got the nerve to tell him that I wasn't interested. I was very apologetic about it, explaining that I was still hung up on my last boyfriend, Eric. That wasn't true, of course, but it was less insulting than the truth. He handed me the flowers and said that he understood, then he left. I thought that was the end of it. I was very wrong. The next day my cousin called me. She sounded hysterical. I asked her what was wrong and she said that Eric, my ex, had been murdered the night before. Someone had snuck into his apartment and strangled him. I couldn't believe it. I was horrified. But I instantly thought of Nick. Could Nick have done that? Was he really that insane? I got my answer about an hour later when Nick texted me again. He wrote, I'm sorry about your ex, but does this mean we can be together now? I didn't respond. I drove straight to the police and showed them the message. They understood my concern, 
but Nick's message wasn't proof that he'd actually done something to Eric. They promised to call him in for questioning, but that was the best they could do. For the rest of the day, I couldn't stop thinking about poor Eric. He was a terrible boyfriend, but he didn't deserve to die. I went to bed pretty early, but I woke up to a loud pounding on my front door. I grabbed a baseball bat just in case and walked downstairs to see who was there. As I expected, Nick was waiting on my porch. He looked furious. I kept the chain on the door so he couldn't get in. Then I told him to leave. You called the cops on me? He screamed. They've been grilling me for hours. He kicked at the door, but the chain held in its place. Go away! I shouted at him. I didn't hurt your boyfriend, he said. I swear. I didn't believe that for a second. Nick instantly lost all his anger. It was like he turned off a switch. His voice went really quiet and he asked if I could let him inside so we could talk things out. I told him no. He nodded and silently walked away. I closed the door and again called the police. They told me to stay inside and wait for them to arrive. I turned on all my lights and sat in my living room. I still had the baseball bat in my hands couldn't sleep, obviously, so I just sat there and waited. After 20 minutes, the police still hadn't come. I thought I'd heard sirens a bit earlier, but I guess they were on another call. Suddenly, I heard soft footsteps coming from the other room. Nick had come back. He was inside the house. I sprung to my feet and held the bat against my chest. I stayed in the center of the room so that Nick wouldn't be able to jump out and surprise me. I know you're there! I shouted. The police are coming! They're already here! Nick shouted from the other room. He slowly walked through the kitchen door, but he wasn't alone. A policeman was with him. Nick held a knife up to his throat. Nick must have gotten to the cop before he could reach my door. Why are you doing this? I asked. I just wanted a second date, Nick said. Is that too much to ask? I looked at the cop, hoping that he'd tell me what to do. He just looked terrified. The holster on his belt was empty, and Nick was pressing so hard on the knife that a trickle of blood slid down the cop's neck. I'll do whatever you say, I told Nick, but you have to let him go. Sorry, Nick said. He's seen too much. I started crying. I begged him not to hurt me. It's okay, he said. Don't cry. He stepped closer with his arms outstretched. He was trying to comfort me with a hug. He still had the bloody knife, though. He wrapped his arms around me and pressed my head into his shoulder. It's okay, it's okay. Moving on instinct, I pushed him off me and then slammed my baseball bat into the side of his head. He wasn't expecting that. He toppled onto the ground, mere feet away from the cop's body. Why did you do that? He asked. I slammed the baseball bat again, this time against his hand. His knife skidded across the floor. I think I broke his wrist, too. He looked up at me, his eyes pleading for me to stop. But I didn't. I struck him again, and he fell flat on the ground. He stopped moving. Another officer arrived on the scene pretty soon after. She called an ambulance to take Nick away. He was still alive, but barely. The first cop wasn't so lucky. Nick is at the hospital right now. I'm waiting to hear if he'll recover, but if he does, it'll be behind bars. I haven't gone on a date since. I don't think I'll be ready for a long, long time. The house was the last one on the street. Advertised at the local estate agent as a well-loved property in need of some general maintenance, it had immediately piqued my interest. The area wasn't well known to me, but it seemed quiet and away from the main thoroughfare into town. The kind of place that troublemakers wouldn't bother, which is what I was in need of as a single mother. The price was just within my budget too, and it only took one viewing for me to decide to take it. My son seemed to like it too, which was a bonus. The first week was a blur of packing and unpacking, replacing the dingy yellow walls of our old apartment with the floral pink wallpaper of the new house. It was clear nobody had lived there in a while since the place was rife with dust and mildew, 
like the windows hadn't been opened in over a year, leaving everything to settle in the crevices. Some pieces of furniture had been left behind, a couple of chairs, an old dining table, and a moth-eaten sofa that went straight into a skip. Upstairs, the wooden bed frames had been abandoned, along with a scuffed dresser and wardrobe, but everything else was missing. The hard floors didn't even have a rug, and several dark stains tarnished the wood in places. About a week after moving into the new house, it started to resemble something more of a home. I managed to grab some furniture from local yard sales and thrift shops and the empty, desolate rooms were soon populated by pops of color. I even let my son Henry choose out some things for his room, since we were no longer confined by the limited space of our old apartment. Everything went smoothly that first week. Henry and I gradually settled into the routine of our new surroundings, and I started to feel like we finally had a place we felt safe. Somewhere we could stay for a while, growing into our environment. I never had a place to call home, and I thought that this might be it but I was wrong. It was the second Tuesday we'd spent living in that house. Henry was at school and I was doing some cleaning, trying to scrub out the old stains in the kitchen. After spending an hour inhaling bleach and scraping the sink clean, I headed upstairs for a short break. There was some laundry to put away, so I was between rooms when I heard it. Some sort of soft hissing sound coming from above me. At first, I paused, laundry basket hoisted in my arm listening carefully. I thought maybe it was the wind or something else from outside, but it was coming from directly above me. I lifted my gaze to the small hatch in the ceiling. The attic had been detailed in the plans of the house, but I had yet to go up there. I had figured it wasn't much of a priority when I had the rest of the house to sort out first, so I hadn't bothered to investigate. Was that where the sounds were coming from? I set the laundry basket down and stretched up onto my tiptoes trying to get a better idea of what I was hearing, but it was too faint to get a proper grasp on it. If there was something up there that I needed to know about, there was no point in delaying any longer. I didn't have any means of getting up there without a ladder, which I didn't currently possess, so I hurried around to my neighbors to see if I could borrow one. Armed with a rusty step ladder, I set it up below the hatch and began to climb listening to that strange undulating hiss noise coming from above. I undid the latch and pushed open the attic door, immediately choking on the dust that was billowing down. Once the air had cleared, I poked my head through the gap, brushing aside a stray cobweb. The attic wasn't thrown into pitch darkness as I expected. A faint grainy light sweeped across the floorboards, illuminating the dust in the air. The gray light was coming from somewhere further in. Swallowing back my apprehension, I hoisted myself up through the hatch and scrambled onto the floor of the attic, finally picking myself up. I dug my phone out of my pocket and switched on the torch function, shining it across my feet. A couple of insects skittered and dispersed into the corners of the room, but I ignored them. Bugs were one thing I wasn't scared of, thanks to growing up with several older brothers. The attic was empty for the most part, except for a couple of old cardboard boxes and black trash bags. What drew my attention, however, was the thing at the very back of the attic. The thing that was emitting that faint, grainy light. It was a television. An old, boxy thing with a VCR slot, like something from the 90s. The screen was filled with fuzzy gray static, the reason for the light and the hissing sound I'd heard from before. I walked closer to the TV, frowning. Why was it turned on? I shone my torch over the walls, but I couldn't see a power plug anywhere. How was it managing to power itself without electricity? The cord slithered loosely across the floorboard, disconnected. Surely it was impossible for a TV like this to work without power. It was all rather bizarre, but there was no point dwelling on something you couldn't explain. I reached for the power button and turned it off. The attic went deathly silent, my torchlight dimming. A faint chill ran over my arms and neck, bringing goosebumps to the surface. Not sure where the feeling was coming from, I did my best to swallow back the dread and cross the attic back to the ladder. I had barely put my foot on the first rung when the TV switched itself back on. The sudden burst of static made me jump, eliciting a soft yell from my lips. I threw back my head and glanced toward the television on the other side of the room. Static once more filled the screen, 
wavy gray lines that made my eyes water the more I looked at it. I stood, frozen, one foot on the ladder, staring into the gloom at the TV. Did it have some kind of faulty wiring? Did that even make sense? What other explanation was there? Because I certainly didn't believe in anything of a paranormal nature. Technology could be unpredictable, even the old stuff. There had to be some kind of reason that I was simply unaware of. Ignoring the slight tremor in my hand, I crossed the attic once more and jabbed the off button, plunging the screen into darkness. I waited a second, then another. When I was certain it wouldn't turn back on, I turned around. This time, what I heard from the television wasn't static. It was a voice, a whisper soft as the wind. The chill from before returned, making me feel cold all over. A flutter of unease made my heart beat faster. Could I have imagined it? I wanted to say yes, but when I turned back around, the TV was on again. The whisper had gone, replaced once more by static, but I couldn't get the sound of it out of my head. I stared at the undulating gray sea on the screen until my eyes began to glimpse something through the chaos. A shape hidden beneath the reams of pixels. It took me a second to realize what I was seeing. A face, or something that resembled a face. I glimpsed two dark eyes, a long jaw, sunken cheeks. I blinked, wishing for the image to disappear, but it was still there, the face amongst the static. With a sharp gasp, I hit the switch again, banishing the face from my view. Instead, my own distorted, terrified gaze stared back through the reflection on the screen. Whatever was wrong with this TV, it wasn't normal. I didn't have an explanation, but it wasn't simply some electrical fault. It was something else. In the end, I decided to just throw the TV out. I didn't know if it could be fixed or if it was worth anything, but I knew that I had to get rid of it. Whatever had happened in this house, with this television, I had no part of it, nor would I involve myself or my son any further. My parents died 12 years ago in an accident. I was a child then, too young to fully process the tragedy of their passing, but from what I heard, it was horrific. They had driven into another car at full speed. The car had been stationary on the side of the road, and the incident had been a total wreck for everybody involved, as the occupant of the car also died. The coroner reported that my mom's car brake had failed. The older I grew, the more I learned about the incident, but that initial hurt had been easy to get over as my grandparents had taken me in. I lived with them from that moment, never once missing grandma's Christmas cookies as she insisted. I was always back home for it regardless of where I was. Grandpa, perhaps from old age, seemed to forget often that I was no longer the five-year-old blonde-haired child that they had picked up from their daughter's home and raised. He gave me a duck doll for Christmas on the occasion that Rick came into our lives. There was no telling how long he stalked us, but when Grandma made a friend at the golf course with a man at least a decade younger than himself, we had no reason to suspect that he would be the terror that almost put a stop to Grandma's 12-year-old tradition. He had just moved into the neighborhood months prior, and he was a good golf player. His name was Eric, but Grandpa called him Rick because it sounded cool. Rick's hair was so blonde it was snow white. He had neither a mustache nor beard, and he always maintained a clean appearance. Courteous and respectful, it wasn't long before Rick was a feature in Grandpa's daily routine. Grandma's only snag with Rick was the fact that he had no family. She never said it to him when he was around, but she seemed to have no problem cackling to everything he said. Grandpa's friendship with Rick blossomed so well that Grandma broke a rule on her Christmas tradition by inviting Rick to have dinner with us as he had no family to spend it with. Rick was nice to bring a cake to the occasion, and he insisted that we eat from it as it was freshly made by his own hands. 
Christmas spirit, he observed. The cake was made with good cheer. Grandpa dropped the cake at the table and offered to bring a knife to cut it up. The cake was opened up and Grandma yelped at the table. Rick asked what was wrong and why everyone was suddenly staring at the cake instead of diving into it. It's Luke here, Grandpa confessed and nodded at me. The little one cannot have chocolate, messes with his body. Rick's face turned sour, his lip hung loose, and I noticed that he was grinding his teeth strangely. It was the first time I had an ory feeling about him, but for someone who was Grandpa's friend for months, it clouded my suspicion. But hey, uh, we can have the cake and he will eat from the food that I made. Grandma offered in a bid to lighten the mood. Grandpa chuckled, but Rick did not. Grandpa asked Rick if he wanted some cake and Rick said that he did not. It turned into a long conversation on cakes that I did not pay any attention to. Grandma said since everybody could not have the cake at the time, it was better to keep it in the freezer and eat in some other time, as it would be better than eating it when only Grandpa and herself could have it. It was in bad manners and, moreover, food was already set. I'm sorry, I have to leave now. Rick gazed distractedly upon his wristwatch and was at once on his feet. Grandpa asked if there was a problem, and he said that there was none as he made his way to the door in a daze. It was a strange occurrence, and when I looked over at Grandma, I was sure I was not alone in my observation. Rick was out the door in a flash. Grandpa went after him, and then stopped at the door, turning about to face us. Something isn't right about Rick today, Grandpa observed as he ambled back to us. Grandma asked what it could possibly be hinting at the fact that Rick may have felt sad from not having a family like us to spend his Christmas with. In her maternal way, she insisted she could speak with him and bring him to understand that we were also family should he need one. I'll call him on the phone, Grandma insisted, and at once she went straight to her cell phone. Grandpa said since we had to wait for Grandma's call for Rick for dinner, he'd be in the bathroom to take a leak. I watched the motions all play out vividly, because what followed was as unhinged as any horror flick could ever invent. Rick was suddenly back, and he was at the door with a butcher's blade in one hand, heavy and thick set, and a pistol in the other hand. He was sweaty and his breathing was irregular. His eyes were glass set and unmoving, fixed on Grandma and I. Rick, are, are you okay? Grandma asked, horrified as I was when Rick started to approach us. Your family took everything from me. Anna was special. The only treasure I had in this world. He recounted as tears streaked down the sides of his face. Your family butchered her in that accident. And now I have to be here, all alone while you... All of you have each other to celebrate with. Oh no, Grandma moaned when it finally dawned on her that Rick was in our lives for a reason. Grandpa was not with us, and Rick noticed. His presence was so terrifying, I could barely breathe. My body was numb, like I was face to face with death itself. Where's George? You all should have just eaten the cake with me and we would go and join our loved ones. Rick laughed in a crazy fit. He pulled the safety off his weapon. There was just enough poison in that cake to finish us off. But now, I don't care. I'll kill you two. And George, when he comes, goddammit. Life flashed before our eyes, and I saw Grandma, and one last act of sacrifice turn her body over mine to shield me from the bullet of our would-be killer. Her heart thudded in her chest, and I heard it echo off her body. She said that she was sorry, slobbering and crying as she spoke, fearing death. Then the gunshot reverberated through the entire house. Grandma twitched when the horrifying sound went off. 
and then she was stiff, unmoving. I wonder why he didn't speak to me about it like a man would, Grandpa said, and at once I felt breath waft into my nostrils as my body opened up in relief. George! Grandma cried and ran into the arms of her hero as Rick lay on the floor, dead from Grandpa's shot, an end to a terrifying Christmas evening. Call the cops, Luke. I knew something wasn't right with Rick today, Grandpa added as I called 911 to report the situation. Every year for about a decade, my two buddies Lance and Stu and I would go on a ski trip. It's been a tradition since we were in high school. We always planned it around St. Patrick's Day. The last year we went, Stu was going through a rough patch. He had just lost his job and his relationship was on the rocks. He had been dating Laura for two years and she started acting distant and staying out later. Stu feared the worst, that she was cheating on him. Because of everything that he was going through, Lance and I decided that this year, the goal would be to help Stu have a good time and unwind. Stu didn't have to do any of the planning. Lance and I did it all so he could focus on enjoying himself. We planned to head up to the mountains Friday night, get settled in the Airbnb, ski Saturday and Sunday, then drive back on Monday. Stu had never done any kind of hallucinogenic before, so Lance and I thought it would be a fun way to end the trip Sunday after we were done on the slopes. We brought the idea up to Stu and he was stoked. He had wanted to try shrooms for years but never had the opportunity. After weeks of Stu stressing out about being unemployed and his girlfriend, our ski weekend finally rolled around. We were all excited, but Stu especially. The guy needed to get his mind off stuff and Lance and I were happy to help. We got to the Airbnb and it was awesome. There were two bedrooms, one bathroom and a jacuzzi outside. The next day, Fresh snow covered the mountains and we shredded. We carved the fresh powder. Stu, who snowboards, was finally successful at doing a backflip going off a jump. You could tell he felt like a million bucks afterward. The day was going well until we took a break for lunch. We sat outside. Lance packed his lunch. He's a chef, so naturally he's a major foodie. He went on and on about how he could save us money and pack a better lunch than we could find at the resort. Lance never lets us down when it comes to food. He made us DIY instant ramen, and it blew the store-bought stuff out of the water. I picked up my phone off the table to check my email, but realized I grabbed the wrong phone. Stu's phone and mine look identical until you look at the background. I need to call Laura, Stu said. I passed him his phone and he walked off. I asked Lance, what do you think of everything going on between them? He shook his head. I wish he'd break up with her. I can't say this with him around, but her late nights, excuses, something is not adding up. He's in denial. You really think she might be cheating? Dude, she didn't come up one night. Like straight up did not come home. We're not in college anymore. When people stay out all night, they're having some adult fun. He looked over at our friend. Stu's free hand covered his face. His body language said he was stressed. He brought his hand up to his hair and held his head as he faced the ground, nodding at whatever Laura said. Lance continued, I just think there was someone better for him out there. Stu came back and smiled at us. How was that? I asked him. He shrugged. He hesitated before answering. If there is someone else, you don't think she'd bring him to our place, do you? I don't know, man, Lance answered. I don't think she would. I tried to reassure him. If you're so worried about her being unfaithful, why don't you just end it? Stu explained that he couldn't imagine his life without Laura. He loved her. Stu had started looking at engagement rings a couple of months before Laura started acting distant. He then explained that he must be paranoid because she would never do that to him. By the end of the day, we were exhausted. We returned to the Airbnb, ordered pizza, drank some beer, and then went to bed to prepare for an early start the next day. The snow wasn't as good as the day before, but we still had a good day on Sunday. After we were done skiing, we hit the grocery store so Lance could get ingredients to make us a feast for our shrooms trip. 
You can cook when you trip? I asked him. Yeah, it's my favorite thing to do when high on anything. Good for us, Stu said. When we got back to the Airbnb, I prepared our shrooms. We took them in a tea. I gave mugs to Lance and Stu and said, Bottoms up. It took about 20 minutes for the shrooms to start kicking in. Soon enough, Lance washed his hands as he moved them back and forth. Stu was sitting on the ground staring at it. It's moving, he whispered, and laughed. I'm going to start cooking so I can eat when I'm really out there, Lance said, standing up. While Lance worked away in the kitchen, Stu and I put on Planet Earth on mute and played a playlist I prepared for this event. We let the music carry us to the African safari we saw on the TV. How long till the food is ready? I yelled to Lance. He came out of the kitchen in a polka dot apron he found in one of the drawers. Maybe 30-ish minutes, he answered. Stu laughed. Nice apron. Lance curtsied. Stu's phone buzzed. A notification appeared on his phone. It was Laura checking in. Hey baby, just checking in on your shroom trip, she said with heart emojis. Stu looked at his phone on the table and looked at me. What is that? He asked me. His demeanor changed into something slightly threatening. I looked at his phone. A text from Laura. I shrugged. Why is she texting you? She's not? That's your phone. I responded. Don't talk to me like I'm stupid. Dude. I said. I'm not. That's your phone. You seemed really confident that she wouldn't bring anyone over to our place. Lance was busy in the kitchen, so I didn't have anyone to look at in disbelief at what was happening. Stu continued. You even tried to get me to break up with her. Why? So you could have her all to yourself? I tried to assure him I was trying to make him feel better. Nothing was going on between Laura and me, but he kept getting angrier and angrier. Nothing I could say could take him off the trajectory he fell into. Look, it's your phone, not mine. Stu continued to accuse me. I could not say anything to get him to stop, so I got up and headed to the kitchen. Don't walk away when I'm talking to you. As he followed me into the kitchen, he went on and on about how I betrayed him and how he couldn't believe I could do something like this. It was like Stu grew angrier with each step. What's going on? Lance asked as he saw us enter the kitchen. Dude, he's nuts. Lance was cleaning something in the sink while I stood beside him. We were chatting and unaware of Stu picking up one of the kitchen knives. He started toward me with it pointed in my direction. Just when he was close enough to me and started to drive his hand forward, Lance turned around into the knife. Stu plunged the knife into his heart. Stu! I yelled. Lance looked down at the knife, confused. He looked at Stu and tried to say something but couldn't get any words out. He looked at me. I ran out of the kitchen to grab my phone to call 911. Now look at what you made me do! Stu yelled from the kitchen. He wasn't supposed to turn around. I was aiming for you! My hands shook as I tried to dial 911, but I had no service. No call would go through. I picked up Stu's phone and tried to trigger the 911 emergency response so I wouldn't need his password. But in all the commotion, my mind blinked on how to do it. He's dead. Stu said plainly. I peered around the corner to see Stu checking Lance's pulse. My girlfriend! My best friend! I lost them because of you! I knew there was no point in trying to talk any sense into him. Stu was lost. All I could hope to do was protect myself. There was no one around for miles. It was just Stu in a homicidal rage and I stuck in a cabin together. I took Stu's phone and the car keys and bolted outside. I crawled into the car and watched as Stu followed me out. I locked the door so he couldn't get in. Snow was falling hard all around us. Unlock the door! Face me like a man! You're a coward! Stu yelled at me. He banged on the windows, trying with all his might to break them. I kept trying to trigger the emergency response on his phone, but I cannot for my life remember how. Stu banged and banged on the car for about an hour before he gave up and went back inside. I sat in the car and cried. If I had known his mental state was that fragile, I never would have suggested doing shrooms. There was no way for me to know it would trigger what it did. 
I waited in the car till morning. Every so often, Stu would creep outside and watch me in the car. Sometimes, he would try again to break the windows. I sat in the car crying and praying for the effect to wear off. When the sun rose, I unlocked the car and went back inside. Stu was passed down on the couch. Lance remained where he was. I kicked Stu to wake him up. I didn't want to get too close. His eyes fluttered open and they were clear once again. What happened? He asked me. You confused our phones and thought Laura was texting me and it triggered something. I motioned to the kitchen. Stu's eyes widened as he saw Lance lying there with his eyes open, unblinking. I did that? His voice cracked. Tears gathered in his eyes. He knew his life was over. I threw his phone at him. Call 911. I'm going to pack my things. I want this trip to be over. The cops and ambulance came soon after Stu called. Stu ended up going to prison for manslaughter. His parents paid some fancy lawyer who convinced the jury he wasn't in his right mind. His lawyer was able to get him the minimum sentence of 15 years. After that, he would be on probation for five. We found out afterward that Laura was cheating on Stu with her boss. Stu begged for my forgiveness, but just seeing him triggered my fear response. I had to tell him to leave me alone. It's been a few years and I haven't heard from him since, but his wild eyes still haunt my nightmares. I've been shopping at my local Costco since I was a child. It was one of the only places my father ever took me to. The beautiful man, my father, was the only family I ever knew. He liked to shop often and said it was the way that he had gotten my mother when he had nothing because, well, at least he could afford her stuff from there whenever he could. When I was 21, my father had died in his sleep from a broken heart that yearned for my mother and I was left all alone. Grief stripped me off everything except Costco. I could work 40 hours a week for cheap but one gets a sense that money was not the only reason that people would shop at Costco. Every piece of clothing that passed my neck was from the local Costco. It was the timeline of the decade. The Costco was the only thing of permanence that remained in my life. But it became familiar. I knew my way around every row and I was convinced that I could march through the aisles with my eyes closed and it was what was happening for the most part as I was too dizzy to observe my surroundings. In the usual way that I would shop at Costco, I had gone on that strange evening when everything would change for me in a matter of suddenness that I struggled to process with. I remember I had a gray top on, and it was what I had on that drew the stranger to me. The inscription on the shirt had been simple but rebellious. It was an 80s hip-hop band called N.W.A., the tag read, F the police. I didn't think too much about it since I had plenty of other shirts like it in my closet, and I didn't really know that much about rap. I was picking up some blouses from the rack when someone came up behind me and seized me by the wrist. His hands were firm and calloused, witnessing the fact that he was someone used to laboring at some hard activity. As hard as his palm was, it was cold. It was that which caused me to flinch but his hands did not let go, wrapped around my wrist like a wrench. A neck, he called me in a strange East European accent as my eyes drifted to his face. He was a young man, cleanly shaven and a neatly pressed shirt tucked in. He had a handsome face, the type that could fulfill a teenager's wild fantasy. But suddenly I pulled my hands from his wrist and he yielded. You have the wrong person, sir, I said to him in a calm tone, as I could say. Almost as soon as I said those words, I saw his face transform through emotions, from light to heavy brooding, that made his brows fall askew. I couldn't have known what he thought in contemplation, and his foreign features provided no clue. I chalked it up to mere confusion, but even those who were confused at approaching a stranger, I thought that maybe it was someone that he knew and showed remorse quickly and apologized for the error. It could have been dismissed as some light humor, as everyone makes mistakes, but 
This man that was in front of me had an unwavering presence. Anit, he called me again. And now I knew something strange was happening. I took a step back. He was at least 6'5", with muscular arms that could seize me without much resistance. I had an already feeling sweep over me, and the charm or whatever aura that he had over me that made me feel relaxed wore off. I was now wary, but I did not show my panic. Excuse me? I looked around the aisle when I was to discover that I was alone. Anybody there? He furrowed his brows and placed a solitary finger on his lips to silence me. He hissed through his fingers, and I obeyed unwittingly. My rapidly beating heart paralyzed my body. Sheer terror that I could not process ravaged my senses. I couldn't move, even if I wanted to run. As far as my legs could carry me away from the menacing glower I was confronted with, I was fixed to my spot as he made his move towards me and placed his hand on my shoulder. You will come with me, and your name is Annette when you try to pay, or I will bash your head against the floor so hard you will be unrecognizable for when the coroner finds you. He said to me, his accent cleared up, I know you are alone. It felt like a nightmare from that moment. It felt like a nightmare, a blur worsening, and I almost fainted. But it was happening and I was no fool to think otherwise. I was being kidnapped to be trafficked. I couldn't feel my legs. I was so terrified of the many things that could go wrong in my life. How I didn't think that this was a possibility. No wonder his hands were so cold and hard. My body quivered on its own and my stomach rumbled loudly. I'll pay, he said, as we made our way to the counter. I watched my hope evaporate with every step that led me into this horrifying maze. A nightmare. The voices in my head echoed loudly. I had the thought of resisting, but I knew that it would come with great bodily harm. He knew I was alone. I was so shaken by the entire episode, and my incapacity to process what was happening I didn't even realize that it drew the attention of one of the reps at the Costco counter. Did I give the items you wanted to you, Claire? I heard a beautiful woman say, and the words thumped into my hearing without distinction. I looked behind me to see if she was talking to someone else. My name isn't Claire, I thought in my head, but when I looked back, our eyes met. Come, come, she said, and just as she did, she pulled me to her and the strange man held my hands. She smiled at him. Sorry, <laughs> she ordered some stuff recently and I wanted to hand it to her. To avoid the scene, he released my hands and in a second I heard a yelling from across the stall. Get down on the ground! Two cops had materialized out of thin air, ordering him to stand down. When he resisted, they shot him with a taste gun. My heart was still whipping wild in my chest. They grabbed the man from the ground when he tried to resist, and they cuffed him before taking him away. Damn these traffickers. I knew he was dangerous the moment I saw him coming in, and I saw him watching you. The rep said to me, Hey, be safe out there. My name is Ross. I'm from Nebraska, and I've never left the state. My big brother Tommy moved to New York City a few years back. He got accepted to university there, and I felt really excited for him. He was going to be the first member of our family to really make something of himself. Before he left, he promised to keep me posted every week. But the longer he stayed there, the less I heard from him. Last summer, I finally got some time off of work and asked him if I could come up and visit. He seemed reluctant at first, but I kept pestering him until he said yes. I booked the cheapest flight and planned to stay there for two weeks. For the first few days, I barely saw him. He said he had a lot of summer classes to keep him busy, and I ended up going to a lot of touristy places myself. It was a bit overwhelming for a small town guy, but I was able to enjoy myself. 
The few times I did see Tommy, he seemed like a completely different person. I had heard that city life could change someone, but I never expected that my own brother would become so irritable and distant. I assumed he was stressed out over classes, especially because he refused to talk about them. I asked him if he could show me around his campus, but he flat out refused. By my fourth day there, I had barely seen him, and I demanded that we at least spend the evening together. I hadn't been to Times Square yet, so I thought that'd be a good place for us to check out. He seemed reluctant, but eventually he gave in. I told him I would treat him to dinner at whatever restaurant he chose. We arrived at Times Square just around sunset. It seemed like such a magical, busy place. Tommy and I walked around for a bit, but he seemed to be rushing everywhere. I told him to slow down, but he wouldn't listen. I tried to stop at a couple of different stores, including the giant M&M factory, but he just kept hurrying around and looking nervous. We passed by a group of people in ratty-looking costumes. They were dressed up like famous cartoon characters and stuff, but their outfits were slightly off. For copyright reasons, I guess. I'd heard about these kinds of people before. They would pressure you into taking a photo with them and then charge you an exorbitant amount of money for it. It was a total scam. Out of all the things we could do in Times Square, I did not want to go near those guys. I thought that Tommy would agree because he was a local and knew better than to fall for a scam like that. But to my surprise, he saw the costume people up ahead and started dragging me towards them. I told Tommy that I wasn't interested, but he said, come on, let's go check it out. He led me toward a man dressed like Elmo from the Muppets, except the costume was the wrong color and the googly eyes looked like they were about to fall off. Tommy leaned close to fake Elmo and whispered something that I couldn't hear. Then he backed away, and Elmo started approaching me. I assumed that my brother knew the actor inside the costume. Maybe we can get a free photo or something. But when Elmo reached me, he didn't seem friendly at all. He grabbed me by the wrist and started pulling me away. I tried to pull myself out of this grip, but I couldn't. His furry hands clamped down on my arm. I called for Tommy to help me, but he just stood there, watching. Elmo violently dragged me through the crowd. We passed a bunch of people along the way, but they just stared at us. No one bothered to help. Even though we were surrounded by hundreds of people, it was like we were totally alone. Tommy disappeared in the crowd. I wasn't sure, but it definitely seemed like he'd set me up. But why? Why would he want me to get hurt? And how would he know that this costume creep was such a psycho? Elmo pulled me further away from the crowd, then pushed me up against a wall. Three other mascots joined him. One dressed like a fatter Iron Man, one who looked like a blue Mickey Mouse, and one that was some sort of off-brand Pikachu. All four of them gathered around me. And even though I couldn't see their real faces under the masks, I could tell that they were ready to hurt me. Why are you doing this? I pleaded. You know why, the fake Elmo muttered. The man in the superhero costume reached into his spandex pants and pulled out a knife. Give us your money, he said, all of it. He spoke loudly enough for other people to hear him, but no one did anything. No one even looked in our direction. I slowly pulled out my wallet and opened it for him to see. I didn't bring a lot of cash with me, just two $20 bills. This is all I have, I told them. Elmo pulled back his furry fist and punched me right in the jaw. You owe us way more than that, he said. Where's the rest of it? While Elmo held me against the wall, the superhero pushed his knife against the side of my throat. Another character grabbed my cash and threw my empty wallet onto the ground. I could hear the costume men whisper to each other, but I didn't know what they were saying. It sounded like they came to some sort of agreement, though. Elmo nodded his head, and then told me, If you don't fork up the rest of the cash, we're gonna take a finger. The superhero pulled back the knife and grabbed my arm. They were serious! He was going to cut off my pinky! I screamed for help, but no one cared. I could see Tommy watching this all happen in the distance, so I begged for him to save me! He just stared. And then he mouthed out two words. I'm sorry. What was going on? 
Why would my own brother set me up like this? I begged for the men in costumes to explain what was going on. How much money did they need? Elmo said, Your brother took 20,000 bucks from us. He said you would pay us back. I didn't understand. Why would Tommy take money from these guys? He had an on-campus job. He had a scholarship. Uh, unless it was all a lie. Unless he'd failed out of his classes and gotten mixed up with these people. That had to be it. And the worst part was, Tommy didn't look guilty at all. His expression was completely blank. As the superhero pressed the knife against the base of my finger, I blurted out, I, I, I need to go to an ATM. I'll give you everything. Good man, Elmo said as he patted me on the head. The closest ATM was near my brother, so the costumed men guided me in that direction. When we reached the ATM, one of the men gave me back my wallet. They were still surrounding me, so I couldn't escape. I typed in my PIN number and tried to withdraw the $20,000 amount, even though I knew I didn't have that much in my account. When an error message came up on the screen, I decided to use that as my distraction. I shouted, OH MY GOD, TOMMY STOLE FROM ME TOO! HE HAS THE MONEY ON HIM! This caused enough confusion among the costume men that I was able to wriggle free and run away. As I raced out of there, I watched the mascots chase after Tommy. I didn't stop to see what they were going to do to him. After that, I went straight to the airport and rebooked my flight back home. Tommy tried to call me twice, but I didn't answer. I still don't know how Tommy had gotten mixed up with these criminals. I don't think I'll ever know the full story. All I know is that a few weeks later, Tommy flew back to Nebraska and moved in with our parents. He refused to say anything about his time in New York. And he was missing three fingers. All I wanted was a nose job, plain and simple as daylight. They bullied me back in elementary school for having nostrils that are too big for the rest of my face, and I honestly thought they were right. So ever since I started making my own money, I've been saving up for one. And sure enough, after four years of saving and living in one room studio apartment, I finally had enough for a nose job. Guess what? The clinic I had an appointment with closed down without notice. Apparently, they hadn't paid their taxes in five years, and whatever crook they were paying to get away with it was finally put behind bars. Just my luck. Of course, in this small town, that was the only available beauty clinic. The nearest recommended facility was in San Francisco. That's a good three-hour drive away. I didn't know if I would be able to afford a big city rate for the procedure, and my two-week paid leave already in motion. I was desperate for an express solution. So, of course, like anyone else in a pinch these days, I turned to internet forums for help. After wasting the first day of said paid leave, I was finally able to find someone with a concrete lead. Kathy Mandy 666 pointed me to a Dr. Daniel Leeds. I gave his number a call. He sounded like a friendly old man who was apparently practicing out of his home at a Highlands, the town's high-end gated community where all those city people who want a taste of the small town life without actually living the small town life lived. Sounded good enough to me. We discussed the payment terms quickly and he actually gave me a 50% discount. Said he wanted to give back to the community. Amazing. A generous wealthy city doctor who gave discounts for small town folks as charity work. I couldn't wait for Dr. Leeds to cut up my nose and be done with this whole thing. Walking away with extra spending money most definitely sounded nice too. As expected, Dr. Daniel Leeds lived in one of those really nice brick country homes you saw in the movies. It actually occurred to me then that for the 25 years that I've been alive, I never once set foot behind the gates of Highlands. And there I was, staring at a Highlands country home, knowing full well I have everything right to be here, and about to have my nose and hopefully my life changed forever. A nurse answered the door and immediately led me to the kitchen where I was served a very fancy looking buffet including a shrimp cocktail. Delightful, I guess. The nurse, Melanie, was a very polite, stern lady, who then led me to a sterile operation room where Dr. Leeds himself stood waiting. Already in his surgery robe, he looked exactly how I imagined he would. In his 60s, well-groomed, and with a friendly smile that could only come from a life lived comfortably. I had already told him everything I needed to about the type of nose I needed, 
So it was straight to changing, lying on the table and anesthetics. Nurse Melanie explained that once I woke up, I was allowed to stay at a room provided by Dr. Leeds at his home for a week to recover. The meds were already taking effect then, so I nodded along and fantasized about how nice that would be. New nose and a free vacation at a nice country home. Not bad at all. As promised, when I woke up, I had been transported to a lush, comfortable bed in one of the rooms of Dr. Leeds country home. The sun filtered through the window. It was a beautiful day. I couldn't wait to see my new improved face. There you are. How are you feeling this afternoon? Asked Dr. Leeds, popping his head into the room. I let out a series of garbled nothings and realized I wasn't fully awake yet. The anesthetics must still be doing its work. Shh, that's all right. Take your time, he said, crossing the room and cradling my head. This is odd. Why does he feel like he can touch me this way? Oh no. Was he your run-of-the-meal pervert then? I let out more garbled noises and tried to pull myself away from him, but that was when I noticed the chains. My arms and legs were chained to the bed. Oh God, what does he want with me? Shh, it's all right. You're safe. Shh. I realized fighting was futile and that the best thing for me to do was to lay still and wait to see just what it is he is going to do with me. Helpless, a chained up toy. Nurse Melanie walked in then, pushing a cart of food. More exquisite, fancy looking food, just like the buffet. She moved aside and I saw that what was on the platter was, there was no mistaking it. On the platter was my old nose. For your initiation, said Dr. Leeds. See, I'm an aesthetician, meaning I pursue beauty. And you, Lois, through your willingness, hard work, and dedication, have also shown that you're also pursuing beauty. Hence, I have decided that you're a worthy resident at my house, where we dedicate ourselves to a lifelong pursuit of beauty. I couldn't understand what he meant. What does he mean, pursuit of beauty? He must have seen the panic in my eyes because he continued. We've beautified your nose, and should you choose, you may consume your old nose, consume your past unbeautified self, and pursue your ideal self, one that I will gladly help you achieve. I looked at my nose on a plate and back to Dr. Leeds. But if you choose not to, well, this will be the end of your journey, and we'll be using your body to help beautify other people, those who will be dedicated to the cause. That drove me over the edge. I just wanted a new nose. Now I have to deal with this mess. Well, I guess at the end of the day, a nose is nothing but flesh, tender meat. Once cooked, it should be good enough to eat. The metallic taste of blood filled my mouth as I masticated on the flesh of my old nose. Tears streamed down my cheek, mixing with the warm, salty liquid. Dr. Leeds watched me with a detached fascination, his eyes gleaming with a morbid curiosity. You're doing very well, Lois, he said, his voice dripping with condescension. You're becoming one of us. With each bite, I felt a part of myself slipping away, replaced by a cold, hollow emptiness. The familiar contours of my face, once the source of my insecurity, now felt alien, a grotesque mask that I was forced to wear. You see, Lois, Dr. Leeds continued, his voice dropping to a conspiratorial whisper. Beauty is not just about appearances. It's about sacrifice, about shedding your old self and embracing your true potential. His words were like poison seeping into my mind, twisting my perception of reality. I was no longer Lois, the girl with the big nose. I was a work in progress, a sculpture being molded into perfection by Dr. Lee's scalp. Days turned into weeks, and I lost myself in the doctor's twisted world. I consumed my body piece by piece, each bite a sacrifice to the altar of beauty. My reflection in the mirror became a stranger, a grotesque caricature of my former self. One day, Dr. Leeds announced that I was ready for the final stage of my transformation. He led me to a room filled with surgical instruments, their gleaming metal surfaces reflecting the harsh fluorescent lights. This is where you will be reborn, Lois, he said his voice filled with a twisted excitement, where you will finally achieve true beauty. I closed my eyes, surrendering myself to the inevitable. The pain was excruciating, 
a searing inferno that consumed my every thought. When it was finally over, I was no longer human. I was a creature of Dr. Leed's creation, a living testament to his twisted obsession. I opened my eyes and a gasp escaped my lips as I saw my reflection in the mirror. I was a chimera, a patchwork of human and animal parts, a grotesque mockery of beauty. Dr. Leed stood behind me, his eyes wide with satisfaction. Magnificent, he breathed. You are truly a work of art. I turned to face him, my eyes burning with red. You monster, I hissed, my voice a distorted echo of my former self. He smiled, his teeth gleaming in the harsh light. I am the artist, Lois, and you are my masterpiece. I live in a small town in New Mexico. We don't have a lot of things to do here besides go off-roading through the desert or hanging out at our one skate park. Last year, the town next to us got a brand new Costco. It was enormous. At any time of day, there were more people walking around that store than the entire population of my town, and it had everything. The prices weren't too bad either. The problem with a big store like that is how it pushes out its competition especially in rural areas like mine. Within six months of its opening, most of the shops in a 100 mile radius had to close down. Nothing could compete. My little town was all but destroyed. We still had one market, but that was really struggling. Everything else shuttered. So when I got my job at Costco, I kept it a secret from all my neighbors. I worked there five days a week, usually the night shift. I figured no one would find out because it was in the next town and if anyone saw me working there, that meant they were customers themselves, so they wouldn't spill my secret. After a few months, I saved up a lot of money, plus none of my neighbors had figured out where I worked. I thought things could go on like this forever, or at least until I had enough saved up to move away. That's when something happened. My pickup truck broke down on the long highway connecting our town with the next town over. I was driving to work at the time, ready to spend all shift unloading a new shipment of beanbag chairs. I tried to call a tow truck, but my phone was dead. I waited on the side of the road until another car stopped next to mine. It was Nadine, one of my neighbors. Nadine hated Costco more than anyone else I knew. She lost her antique store after Costco moved in, and even though Costco definitely didn't sell antiques, she blamed the big store for her loss of customers. I desperately needed Nadine to drive me, but I couldn't tell her that. She'd absolutely flip out. When she offered me a ride, I told her no, but I asked if I could borrow her phone to call a tow truck. She didn't have one, of course she didn't, so she asked me again if I needed a ride. It was already getting dark and I seriously didn't want to be alone on the road at night, so I braced myself and told her that I needed a ride to Costco. Her eyes lit up, but not in an angry way. Wow, that's exactly where I'm going. Hop in. I couldn't believe it. When had she changed her mind? I thought she'd be furious with me. Breathing a sigh of relief, I crawled into her truck and she started driving. We sat in silence for a while. The long road stretched out in front of us until Nadine asked, So, why are you going to Costco? I work there now, I told her. And you? She laughed for a second. It was a cold laugh. Then she said, check out the back. She was talking about the bed of her truck. I looked behind me and gasped. There were explosives back there. Are you going to blow up the building? I asked. She laughed again. Tell me this is a joke. She didn't say anything. Her truck began to speed up. She was going over 80. If I tried to jump out the door, I'd be splattered against the road. Please, you can't do this. You know I have to, she said. All I gotta do is drive into that building and boom, everything will be better. I begged her to change her mind. She wasn't a killer. She was a good person at heart. She didn't listen. Her mind was made up. I tried to grab at her steering wheel, but she shoved me hard. I fell back against the window. If you make me crash, she said, then we'll both explode. You of all people know how dangerous explosives are. She was right. 
I was raised by a firefighter dad who taught me all about explosives and gun safety and all sorts of survival stuff. That's when I realized that I didn't need to stop Nadine at all. I just needed to defuse those bombs. As she continued speeding down the highway, I slid open the window behind us and crawled into the trunk bed. Nadine didn't bother trying to stop me. She didn't think I'd be able to thwart her plan. There were three separate boxes of explosives in the bed, each one shaking horribly from the bumpy road even though they were duct taped to the truck. It was terrifying to be so close to something that could kill me in less than a second. I reached the first of the three explosives and saw a bunch of wires and cords. There wasn't a timer or anything, but it looked like it was set to explode on impact. All I had to do was clip one of the wires. I knew which one too. Unfortunately, I didn't have any scissors. From inside the truck, Nadine started laughing. You don't have any time. I'll be there in two minutes. She was right. We were starting to pass more and more buildings as we got closer to town. I reached my face toward the explosive and bit into the wire. It was the only thing I could think of. The spark shocked my tongue, but I was able to defuse it safely. Thank God. Then I crawled over to the second box. I could feel the truck speeding up. Nadine saw what I'd done and knew that she had to reach Costco before I could defuse the other two bombs. The second device looked exactly the same as the first. Once again, I bit into the wire and its digital screen faded to black. It too was diffused. We passed by more cars and streetlights. The Costco building was just ahead. I had less than a minute before she'd drive into the building. I frantically grabbed the third device. This one was placed upside down in its box, meaning I'd have to pick up the whole device and flip it around if I wanted to reach the right wire. And I didn't have time. The trunk jumped wildly as Nadine drove over the race sidewalk and into the Costco parking lot. I ripped the third device out of the box and pulled it to my chest. At the very last second, I bit into the wire and grabbed onto the side of the truck, bracing for impact. My whole body flew into the air as Nadine's truck slammed straight into the side of the building. After that, I blacked out. When I woke up, paramedics were gathered all around me, checking my pulse and shining lights into my eyes. I asked them what happened. A police officer stepped forward and thanked me for defusing all three bombs. If I hadn't been there, a lot more people would have died. This whole building would be rubble. How did I survive the crash? I mumbled. He nodded toward the building where Nadine's truck was crushed against the wall right next to a giant pile of beanbag chairs that were waiting to be brought inside. You landed in the perfect spot, the policeman said. I can't believe how lucky you are. I spent the next few days recovering in the hospital. A bunch of people came to visit, including my boss. She offered me a pretty big bonus because of all the people I'd saved. And as for Nadine, she died on impact, the only casualty that night. I'd always had a distaste for social media. It had always seemed pointless to me. Arbitrary. What was the point of keeping up with a life that wasn't your own? Who cared really about other people in a way that warranted the need to track their every move online? I would have stayed well away from any kind of social media if it was up to me, but it was the only way I could keep in touch with my friends after I left college. Which is why, after being begged by my buddies, I ended up downloading TikTok. It wasn't like the conventional social media sites. This one was all about short form videos. I had to admit there was some kind of entertainment value involved and there was something for everyone on there. I didn't hate the app as much as other social media sites, so I decided to keep it. It wasn't like I went on it regularly anyway, just every now and then, when I was bored or was curious about what my friends were up to, since we didn't always have time to talk or meet up between work. One evening, I was tired from my day job and looking for something to take my mind off of grueling customer service, so I decided to pull up the TikTok app and check out the latest videos on my feed. Most of it was boring, mindless content, and I was almost about to switch it off when something caught my attention. It was the video at the bottom of the screen. I couldn't see it all, but I could see enough to notice that there was something weird about it, something familiar. I paused and sat up bringing the screen closer to my face as I scrolled down to the video. As soon as the full image was revealed, 
I felt my blood run cold. No wonder it seemed familiar. I was looking at my own apartment, specifically the living room. Why was there a video of my apartment on TikTok? At first, I thought I was mistaken and it was something similar, but then I saw the photographs on the walls and knew it wasn't just similar, it was the exact same. My pulse thudding in my ears, I clicked on the video to watch the full thing. It was only 20 seconds long and showed nothing but the inside of my apartment's living room. I'd have thought it was just a picture, but the camera shook right at the end, and when I turned the volume up, I could hear someone breathing very faintly in the background. What the hell? The person who posted the video was called Home Invader 202, and this video was the only one on their profile. Their bio was empty, and they didn't have a profile picture. The whole account was empty apart from that one video, taken of the inside of my apartment. It didn't make sense. My immediate assumption, of course, was that it was a prank. One of my friends could have easily taken the quick 20 second video while they had been over one time and uploaded it to a new account, probably with the intent of freaking me out. Once I'd realized that, I calmed down and thought a bit more rationally. I went to the video's comment section and scrolled through. There weren't too many comments, mostly people asking, what is this? But then I saw a comment that had been posted by one of my friends saying, isn't that Beth's apartment? I hit reply and typed out my response. Was this you, Lydia, or was it Josh? She didn't reply right away, so I put my phone down and tried not to dwell on it. There was no way a stranger could have posted that. I was serious about security and never left my apartment unlocked, even when I was home. Whoever took that video had to have been invited inside by me, and the only person who ever came to visit were my friends, Lydia and Josh. There was no other possibility, at least not any that was worth contemplating. Neither Lydia or Josh replied to my comment, so I figured it must have been them and dropped the matter completely. It wasn't until a few days later when another video from Home Invader 202 appeared on my For You page. This time, it was enough to send chills prickling all over my body. The video was longer than the last one, and this time, the videographer moved. The video started from the hallway of the apartment before going into the living room. From there, it showed my kitchen, dirty pots still stacked up on the side of the counter. What unnerved me the most was that in the video, it was clearly nighttime. I could see the dusky sky through the window and the glow of street lamps from the road below. I very rarely had anyone over at this time of night. In fact, I couldn't even remember the last time someone was in my apartment past dark. So when had they taken this video? It had to be Lydia or Josh. I didn't even want to entertain the thought that it could have been someone else, a stranger. But it still didn't make sense. Why would they post these videos when it wasn't even guaranteed I'd see them? It was only by chance that the first video had appeared on my For You feed, wasn't it? Deciding to settle matters, I phoned Lydia to ask her directly. I wasn't bothered about the videos themselves, I just wanted to know when she'd been in my apartment late enough to film while it was still dark outside. She picked up on the third ring, sounding tired. Hey Beth, what's up? Did you post those videos to TikTok? I asked without preamble. That seemed to wake her up and her voice changed when she spoke. You mean those videos of the inside of your apartment? Yes, I said shortly. Did you post them? No, Lydia said without hesitation. It wasn't me, but I did comment on one of them. I frowned. Lydia was terrible at lying, and it sounded like she was telling the truth. Then it was Josh. I don't know, she admitted. But I don't think so. Why would he do something like this? I shook my head, then realized she couldn't see me. You know what he's like. He's probably doing it to mess with me. Maybe, Lydia said. But I know he's been really busy with his new job. He's barely even had time to meet up with me. I doubt he'd have time to do something like this. I chewed on my bottom lip, knowing she was right. Even if Josh was more likely to be the one to prank me, this didn't seem like the sort of thing he would do. But that still left me with the question, who posted the videos? Are you okay, Beth? Lydia asked me when I went quiet. You don't think someone... She trailed off, but I knew what she was thinking. 
if it wasn't either of them, then it had to be a stranger. A stranger who broke into my apartment and took a video while I wasn't aware. The thought made me feel sick to my stomach. It's fine, I'll figure it out, I said quickly. Sorry to bother you. We spoke for a little longer before I hung up. I sat for a while staring at the blank screen of my phone before pulling up Home Invader 202's profile. I went to the latest video and dropped a comment. Who are you? Another video appeared later that week, in a similar vein to the last two. This one was taken at night again, and it was so much worse than the others. Like before, it started from the hallway of my apartment, touring through the living room and kitchen before going down the small corridor towards my bedroom. As soon as I saw the gloved hand reach for the door to my bedroom, my insides went ice cold with dread. In the video, the door opened and a faint stream of moonlight fell through the window, highlighting the figure in the bed. The figure was obviously me fast asleep. I wanted to throw my phone away from me, cover my face in horror, but I couldn't. All I could do was keep watching as the stranger in the video recorded me sleeping. It lasted for a few seconds, my heavy breaths mingling with the person behind the cameras before the video finally cut off. I didn't know what to do. I felt suffocated with dread. I had no idea who this person was or how they were getting into my apartment, but I needed answers. Who the hell are you? Why are you doing this? I commented on the video. It was already getting late and I was terrified. What if the stranger came back? What if they did something even worse? I knew I had to call the police, but what could they do if there was no clue as to the identity of the person behind the account? I clicked on the TikTok video again, and in a mixture of anger and fear added another comment. Just leave me the hell alone. The silence after my last comment on the video was deafening. No new video popped up, no response. Sleep, however, became a stranger. Every creak of the floorboards, every rustle of wind outside was a potential intruder. Days bled into a tense, paranoid existence. Then one night, a notification jolted me awake. It wasn't a video, but a single live broadcast. Home Invader 202 was live. Heart hammering, I clicked on it. The grainy screen showed my bedroom, everything seemingly still. But then, the camera panned. It revealed a figure, cloaked in darkness, sitting on the edge of my bed. My bed. My scream died in my throat as the figure spoke, his voice a chilling rasp. You shouldn't have asked me to leave. He tilted the camera, revealing a face obscured by a mask, but the glint of his eyes, hungry and predatory, sent a primal terror through me. He wasn't just there to watch. A dark desire burned in those eyes. Suddenly the room filled with a sickeningly sweet scent. My head swam, my vision blurred. Panic choked me, but my body felt heavy, unresponsive. The figure moved closer, his voice a seductive murmur. Don't worry, you'll enjoy this. The last thing I saw before the darkness took over completely was the glint of a blade catching the moonlight the promise of a horrific violation mingling with the terror in his eyes. My apartment had become a cage, and the monster I'd invited through social media's voyeuristic lens was about to claim me, not just as a victim, but as a twisted object of his depraved desires.